This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kevin, a neural engine by Amazon Web Services. In conjunction with Laude Corpus, Software Safety, Audiobook Library Essentials, and Project Gutenberg. The Veil of Isis. Part 2. Religion. Chapter 1. Yea, the time cometh, that whomsoever killeth you, will think that he doeth God's service. Gospel according to John, 16. 2. Let him be anathema, who shall say that human sciences ought to be pursued in such a spirit of freedom that one may be allowed to hold as true their assertions even when opposed to revealed doctrines. Ecumenical Council of 1870. Gloss. The Church. Where is it? King Henry VI, Act 1. S.C. 1. In the United States of America, 60,000, 60,428, men are paid salaries to teach the science of God in his relations to his creatures. These men contract to impart to us the knowledge which treats of the existence, character, and attributes of our Creator, his laws and government, the doctrines we are to believe and the duties we are to practice. 5,000, 5,141, of them with the prospect of 1,273 theological students to help them in time, teach the science according to a formula prescribed by the Bishop of Rome, to 5 million people. 55,000, 55,287, local and traveling ministers, representing 15 different denominations, each contradicting the other upon more or less vital theological questions, instruct, in their respective doctrines, 33,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
since the materialists deny the phenomena. p. 3. Without investigation, and since the theologians in admitting them offer us the poor choice of two palpable absurdities the devil and miracles we can lose little by applying to the theurgists, and they may actually help us to throw a great light upon a very dark subject. Professor A. Butleroff, of the Imperial University of St. Petersburg, remarks in a recent pamphlet, entitled Mediumistic Manifestations, as follows, Let the facts, of modern spiritualism, belong if you will to the number of those which were more or less known by the ancients, let them be identical with those which in the dark ages gave importance to the office of Egyptian priest or Roman augur, let them even furnish the basis of the sorcery of our Siberian shaman, let them be all these, and, if they are real facts, it is no business of ours. All the facts in nature belong to science, and every addition to the store of science enriches instead of impoverishing her. If humanity has once admitted a truth, and then in the blindness of self-conceit denied it, to return to its realization is a step forward and not backward. Since the day that modern science gave what may be considered the death blow to dogmatic theology, by assuming the ground that religion was full of mystery, and mystery is unscientific, the mental state of the educated class has presented a curious aspect. Society seems from that time to have been ever balancing itself upon one leg, on an unseen tightrope stretched from our visible universe into the invisible one, uncertain whether the end hooked on faith in the latter might not suddenly break, and hurl it into final annihilation. The great body of nominal Christians may be divided into three unequal portions, materialists, spiritualists, and Christians proper. The materialists and spiritualists make common cause against the hierarchical pretensions of the clergy, who, in retaliation, denounce both with equal acerbity. The materialists are as little in harmony as the Christian sects themselves the Comtists, or, as they call themselves, the Positivists, being despised and hated to the last degree by the schools of thinkers, one of which Maudsley honorably represents in England. Positivism, be it remembered, is that religion of the future about whose founder even Huxley has made himself wrathful in his famous lecture, The Physical Basis of Life, and Maudsley felt obliged, in behalf of modern science, to express himself thus, it is no wonder that scientific men should be anxious to disclaim Combe as their lawgiver, and to protest against such a king being set up to reign over them. Not conscious of any personal obligation to his writings conscious how much, in some respects, he has misrepresented the spirit and pretensions of science they repudiate the allegiance which his enthusiastic disciples would force upon them, and which popular opinion is fast coming to think a natural one. They do. p. 4. Well in thus making a timely assertion of independence, for if it be not done soon, it will soon be too late to be done well. When a materialistic doctrine is repudiated so strongly by two such materialists as Huxley and Maudsley, then we must think indeed that it is absurdity itself. Among Christians there is nothing but dissension. Their various churches represent every degree of religious belief, from the omnivorous credulity of blind faith to a condescending and high-toned deference to the deity which thinly masks an evident conviction of their own deific wisdom. All these sects believe more or less in the immortality of the soul. Some admit the intercourse between the two worlds as a fact, some entertain the opinion as a sentiment, some positively deny it, and only a few maintain an attitude of attention and expectancy. Impatient of restraint, longing for the return of the Dark Ages, the Romish Church frowns at the diabolical manifestations, and indicates what she would do to their champions had she but the power of old. Were it not for the self-evident fact that she herself is placed by science on trial, and that she is handcuffed, she would be ready at a moment's notice to repeat in the nineteenth century the revolting scenes of former days. As to the Protestant clergy, so furious is their common hatred towards spiritualism, that as a secular paper very truly remarks, they seem willing to undermine the public faith in all the spiritual phenomena of the past, as recorded in the Bible, if they can only see the pestilent modern heresy stabbed to the heart. Summoning back the long-forgotten memories of the Mosaic laws, the Romish church claims the monopoly of miracles, and of the right to sit in judgment over them, as being the sole heir thereto by direct inheritance. The Old Testament, exiled by Colenso, his predecessors and contemporaries, is recalled from its banishment. The prophets, whom His Holiness the Pope condescends at last to place, if not on the same level with himself, at least at a less respectful distance, are dusted and cleaned. The memory of all the diabolical abracadabra is evoked anew. The blasphemous horrors perpetrated by paganism, it's p. 5. Phallic worship, thaumaturgical wonders wrought by Satan, human sacrifices, 
incantations, witchcraft, magic, and sorcery are recalled and demonism is confronted with spiritualism for mutual recognition and identification. Our modern demonologists conveniently overlook a few insignificant details, among which is the undeniable presence of heathen phallism in the Christian symbols. A strong spiritual element of this worship may be easily demonstrated in the dogma of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mother of God, and a physical element equally proved in the fetish worship of the holy limbs of Estius. Cosmo and Damiano, at Isernia, near Naples, a successful traffic in which expo tow and wax was carried on by the clergy, annually, until barely a half century ago. We find it rather unwise on the part of Catholic writers to pour out their vials of wrath in such sentences as these. In a multitude of pagodas, the phallic stone, ever and always assuming, like the Grecian batalos, the brutally indecent form of the linum, the Mahadeva. Before casting slurs on a symbol whose profound metaphysical meaning is too much for the modern champions of that religion of sensualism par excellence, Roman Catholicism, to grasp, they are in duty bound to destroy their oldest churches, and change the form of the cupolas of their own temples. The Mahodi of Elephanta, the round tower of Bongalpur, the minarets of Islam either rounded or pointed are the originals of the Campanile Column of San Marco, at Venice, of the Rochester Cathedral, and of the modern Duomo of Milan. All of these steeples, turrets, domes, and Christian temples, are the reproductions of the primitive idea of the lithos, the upright phallus. The western tower of St. Paul's Cathedral, London, says the author of the Rosicrucians, is one of the double litho placed always in front of every temple, Christian as well as heathen. Moreover, in all Christian churches, particularly in Protestant churches, where they figure most conspicuously, the two tables of stone of the Mosaic dispensation are placed over the altar, side by side, as a united stone, the tops of which are rounded. The right stone is masculine, the left feminine. Therefore neither Catholics nor Protestants have a right to talk of the indecent forms of heathen monuments so long as they ornament their own churches with the symbols of the Lina Mignoni, and even write the laws of their God upon them. Another detail not redounding very particularly to the honor of the Christian clergy might be recalled in the word Inquisition. The Torrents. p. 6. Of human blood shed by this Christian institution, and the number of its human sacrifices, are unparalleled in the annals of paganism. Another still more prominent feature in which the clergy surpass their masters, the heathen, is sorcery. Certainly in no pagan temple was black magic, in its real and true sense more practiced than in the Vatican. While strongly supporting exorcism as an important source of revenue, they neglected magic as little as the ancient heathen. It is easy to prove that the sortilegium, or sorcery, was widely practiced among the clergy and monks so late as the last century, and is practiced occasionally even now. Anathematizing every manifestation of occult nature outside the precincts of the church, the clergy notwithstanding proofs to the contrary call it the work of Satan, the snares of the fallen angels, who rush in and out from the bottomless pit, mentioned by John in his Kabbalistic revelation, from whence arises a smoke as the smoke of a great furnace. Intoxicated by its fumes, round this pit are daily gathering millions of spiritualists, to worship at the abyss of Baal. More than ever arrogant, stubborn, and despotic, now that she has been nearly upset by modern research, not daring to interfere with the powerful champions of science, the Latin Church revenges herself upon the unpopular phenomena. A despot without a victim, is a word void of sense, a power which neglects to assert itself through outward, well-calculated effects, risks being doubted in the end. The church has no intention to fall into the oblivion of the ancient myths, or to suffer her authority to be too closely questioned. Hence she pursues, as well as the times permit, her traditional policy. Lamenting the enforced extinction of her ally, the Holy Inquisition, she makes a virtue of necessity. The only victims now within reach are the spiritists of France. Recent events have shown that the meek spouse of Christ never disdains to retaliate on helpless victims. Having successfully performed her part of Deus Ex Machina from behind the French bench, which has not scrupled to disgrace itself for her, the Church of Rome sets to work and shows in the year 1876 what she can do. From the whirling tables and dancing pencils of profane spiritualism, the Christian world is warned to turn to the divine miracles of Lord. Meanwhile, the ecclesiastical authorities utilize their time in arranging for other more easy triumphs, calculated to scare the superstitious out of their senses. So, acting under orders, the clergy hurl dramatic, if not very impressive anathemas from every Catholic diocese, threaten right and left, 
excommunicate and curse. Perceiving. P. 7. Finally, that her thunderbolts directed even against crowned heads fall about as harmlessly as the Jupiterian lightnings of Offenbach's Kalkos. Rome turns about in powerless fury against the victimized protégés of the Emperor of Russia the unfortunate Bulgarians and Servians. Undisturbed by evidence and sarcasm, unbaffled by proof, the Lamb of the Vatican impartially divides his wrath between the liberals of Italy, the impious whose breath has the stench of the sepulchre, the schismatic Russian sarmates, and the heretics and spiritualists, who worship at the bottomless pit where the great dragon lies in wait. Mr. Gladstone went to the trouble of making a catalogue of what he terms the flowers of speech, disseminated through these papal discourses. Let us call a few of the chosen terms used by this vice-grant of him who said that, Whosoever shall say thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. They are selected from authentic discourses. Those who oppose the Pope are wolves, Pharisees, thieves, liars, hypocrites, dropsical children of Satan, sons of perdition, of sin, and corruption. Satellites of Satan in human flesh, monsters of hell, demons incarnate, stinking corpses, men issued from the pits of hell, traitors and Judases led by the spirit of hell, children of the deepest pits of hell, etc., etc., the whole piously collected and published by Don Pasquale de Francisis, whom Gladstone has, with perfect propriety, termed, an accomplished professor of flunkeyism and things spiritual. Since His Holiness the Pope has such a rich vocabulary of invectives at his command, by wonder that the Bishop of Toulouse did not scruple to utter the most undignified falsehoods about the Protestants and spiritualists of America people doubly odious to a Catholic in his address to his diocese. Nothing, he remarks, is more common in an era of unbelief than to see a false revelation substitute itself for the true one, and minds neglect the teachings of the Holy Church, to devote themselves to the study of divination and the occult sciences. With a fine episcopal contempt for statistics, and strangely confounding in his memory the audiences of the revivalists, Moody and Sankey, and the patrons of dark and seance rooms, he utters the unwarranted and fallacious assertion that it has been proven that spiritualism, in the United States, has caused one-sixth of all the cases of suicide and insanity. He says that it is not possible that the spirits teach either an exact science, because they are lying demons, or a useful science, because the character. P. A. Of the Word of Satan like Satan himself, is sterile. He warns his dear collaborators, that the writings in favor of spiritualism are under the ban, and he advises them to let it be known that to frequent spiritual circles with the intention of accepting the doctrine, is to apostatize from the Holy Church, and assume the risk of excommunication. Finally, says he, publish the fact that the teaching of no spirit should prevail against that of the pulpit of Peter, which is the teaching of the Spirit of God himself. Aware of the many false teachings attributed by the Roman Church to the Creator, we prefer disbelieving the latter assertion. The famous Catholic theologian, Tillemon, assures us in his work that all the illustrious pagans are condemned to the eternal torments of hell, because they lived before the time of Jesus, and, therefore, could not be benefited by their redemption. He also assures us that the Virgin Mary personally testified to this truth over her own signature in a letter to a saint. Therefore, this is also a revelation the Spirit of God himself teaching such charitable doctrines. We have also read with great advantage the topographical descriptions of hell and purgatory in the celebrated treatise under that name by a Jesuit, the Cardinal Bayarmon. A critic found that the author, who gives a description from a divine vision with which he was favored, appears to possess all the knowledge of a land measure about the secret tracks and formidable divisions of the bottomless pit. Justin Martyr having actually committed to paper the heretical thought that after all Socrates might not be altogether fixed in hell, his Benedictine editor criticizes this too benevolent father very severely. Whoever doubts the Christian charity of the Church of Rome in this direction is invited to peruse the censure of the Sorbonne, on Marmontel's Belisarius. The Odium Theologicum blazes in it on the dark sky of Orthodox theology like an aurora borealis the precursor of God's wrath, according to the teaching of certain medieval divines. We have attempted in the first part of this work to show, by historical examples, how completely men of science have deserved the stinging sarcasm of the late Professor de Morgan, who remarked of them that they were the priests cast off guard, died to escape detection. The Christian clergy are, in like manner, attired in the cast off garb of the heathen priesthood, acting diametrically in opposition to their God's moral precepts, but nevertheless, sitting in judgment over the whole world. When dying on the cross, the martyred man of sorrows forgave his enemies. His last words were a prayer in their behalf. 
He taught his disciples to curse not, but to bless, even their foes. But the heirs of p. 9. St. Peter, the self-constituted representatives on earth of that same meek Jesus, unhesitatingly curse whoever resists their despotic will. Besides, was not the sun long since crowded by them into the background? They make their obeisance only to the Dowager Mother, for according to their teaching again through the direct Spirit of God, she alone acts as a mediatrix. The Ecumenical Council of 1870 embodied the teaching into a dogma to disbelieve which is to be doomed forever to the bottomless pit. The work of Don Pasquale de Francisus is positive on that point, for he tells us that, as the Queen of Heaven owes to the present Pope the finest gem in her coronet, since he has conferred on her the unexpected honor of becoming suddenly immaculate, there is nothing she cannot obtain from her son for her church. Some years ago, certain travelers saw in Berry, Italy, a statue of the Madonna, braided in a flounce pink skirt over a swelling crinoline. Pious pilgrims who may be anxious to examine the regulation wardrobe of their god's mother may do so by going to southern Italy, Spain, and Catholic North and South America. The Madonna of Berry must still be there between two vineyards in a Locanda, gin shop. When last seen, a half-successful attempt had been made to clothe the infant Jesus. They had covered his legs with a pair of dirty, scallop-edged pantaloons. An English traveler having presented the mediatrix with a green silk parasol, the grateful population of the Cantadini, accompanied by the village priest, went in procession to the spot. They managed to stick the sunshade, opened, between the infant's back and the arm of the virgin which embraced him. The scene and ceremony were both solemn and highly refreshing to our religious feelings. For there stood the image of the goddess in its niche, surrounded with a row of ever-burning lamps, the flames of which, flickering in the breeze, infect God's pure air with an offensive smell of olive oil. The mother and son truly represent the two most conspicuous idols of monotheistic Christianity. For a companion to the idol of the poor Cantadini of Berry, go to the rich city of Rio Janeiro. In the church of the Duomo del Condelaria, in a long hall running along one side of the church, there might be seen, a few years ago, another Madonna. Along the walls of the hall there is a line of saints, each standing on a contribution box, which thus forms a fit pedestal. In the center of this line, under a gorgeously rich canopy of blue silk, is exhibited the Virgin Mary leaning on the arm of Christ. Our Lady is arrayed in a very décolleté blue satin dress with short p. 10. Sleeves, showing, to great advantage, a snow-white, exquisitely molded neck, shoulders, and arms. The skirt equally of blue satin with an overskirt of rich lace and gauze puffs, is as short as that of a ballet dancer, hardly reaching the knee. It exhibits a pair of finely shaped legs covered with flesh-colored silk tights, and blue satin French boots with very high red heels. The blonde hair of this mother of God is arranged in the latest fashion, with a voluminous chignon and curls. As she leans on her son's arm, her face is lovingly turned toward her only begotten, whose dress and attitude are equally worthy of admiration. Christ wears an evening dress coat, with swallowtail, black trousers, and low-cut white vest, varnished boots, and white kid gloves over one of which sparkles a rich diamond ring, worth many thousands we must suppose a precious Brazilian jewel. Above this body of a modern Portuguese dandy, is a head with the hair parted in the middle, a sad and solemn face, and eyes whose patient look seems to reflect all the bitterness of this last insult flung at the majesty of the crucified. The Egyptian Isis was also represented as a virgin mother by her devotees, and as holding her infant son, Horus, in her arms. In some statues and basso relievos, when she appears alone she is either completely nude or veiled from head to foot. But in the mysteries, in common with nearly every other goddess, she is entirely veiled from head to foot, as a symbol of a mother's chastity. It would not do us any harm were we to borrow from the ancients some of the poetic sentiment in their religions, and the innate veneration they entertained for their symbols. It is but fair to say at once that the last of the true Christians died with the last of the direct apostles. Max Muller forcibly asked, how can a missionary in such circumstances meet the surprising questions of his pupils, unless he may point to that seed, and tell them what Christianity was meant to be? Unless he may show that, like all other religions, Christianity too, has had its history, that the Christianity of the 19th century is not the Christianity of the Middle Ages, and that the Christianity of the Middle Ages was not that of the early councils, that the Christianity of the early councils was not that of the apostles, and that what has been said by Christ, that alone was well said? 
Thus we may infer that the only characteristic difference between modern Christianity and the old heathen faith is the belief of the former in a personal devil and in hell. The Aryan nations had no devil, says Max Muller. Pluto, though of a somber character, was a very p. 11. Respectable personage, and Loki, the Scandinavian, though a mischievous person, was not a fiend. The German goddess, Hell, too, like Proserpine, had once seen better days. Thus, when the Germans were indoctrinated with the idea of a real devil, the Semitic Seth, Satan or Diabolus, they treated him in the most good-humored way. The same may be said of Hell. Hades was quite a different place from our region of eternal damnation, and might be termed rather an intermediate state of purification. Neither does the Scandinavian Hell or Hela imply either a state or a place of punishment, for when Frigga, the grief-stricken mother of Baldur, the white god, who died and found himself in the dark abodes of the shadows, Hades, sent Hermann, a son of Thor, in quest of her beloved child, the messenger found him in the inexorable region alas, but still comfortably seated on a rock, and reading a book. The Norse kingdom of the dead is moreover situated in the higher latitudes of the polar regions, it is a cold and cheerless abode, and neither the gelid halls of Hela, nor the occupation of Baldur present the least similitude to the blazing hell of eternal fire and the miserable damned sinners with which the church so generously peoples it. No more is it the Egyptian Amenthes, the region of judgment and purification, nor the under the abyss of darkness of the Hindus, for even the fallen angels hurled into it by Shiva, are allowed by Parabrahma to consider it as an intermediate state, in which an opportunity is afforded them to prepare for higher degrees of purification and redemption from their wretched condition. The Gehenna of the New Testament was a locality outside the walls of Jerusalem, and in mentioning it, Jesus used but an ordinary metaphor. Whence then came the dreary dogma of hell, that Archimedean lever of Christian theology, with which they have succeeded to hold in subjection the numberless millions of Christians for nineteen centuries? Assuredly not from the Jewish scriptures, and we appeal for corroboration to any well-informed Hebrew scholar. The only designation of something approaching hell in the Bible is Gehenna or Hinnom, a valley near Jerusalem, where was situated Topet, a place where a fire was perpetually kept for sanitary purposes. The prophet Jeremiah informs us that the Israelites used to sacrifice their children to Moloch Hercules on that spot, and later we find Christians quietly replacing this divinity by their God of mercy, whose wrath will not be appeased, unless the church sacrifices to him her unbaptized children and sinning sons on the altar of eternal damnation. Whence then did the divine learn so well the conditions of hell, as p. 12. To actually divide its torments into two kinds, the pina dami and pony census, the former being the privation of the beatific vision, the latter the eternal pains in a lake of fire and brimstone? If they answer us that it is in the Apocalypse, 20. 10. We are prepared to demonstrate whence the theologist John himself derived the idea, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented for ever and ever he says. Laying aside the esoteric interpretation that the devil or tempting demon meant our own earthly body, which after death will surely dissolve in the fiery or ethereal elements, the word eternal by which our theologians interpret the words forever and ever does not exist in the Hebrew language, either as a word or meaning. There is no Hebrew word which properly expresses eternity, Bulam, according to Leclerc, only imports a time whose beginning or end is not known while showing that this word does not mean infinite duration, and that in the Old Testament the word forever only signifies a long time, Archbishop Tillotson has completely perverted its sense with respect to the idea of hell torments. According to his doctrine, when Sodom and Gomorrah are said to be suffering eternal fire, we must understand it only in the sense of that fire not being extinguished till both cities were entirely consumed. But, as to hellfire the words must be understood in the strictest sense of infinite duration. Such is the decree of the learned divine. For the duration of the punishment of the wicked must be proportionate to the eternal happiness of the righteous. So he says, These, speaking of the wicked, shall go away epsilon iota sigma kappa omicron lambda alpha sigma iota nu alpha iota omicron nu iota omicron nu into eternal punishment, but the righteous epsilon iota sigma zeta omicron epsilon nu alpha iota omicron nu iota omicron nu into life eternal. The Reverend T. Cernan, commenting on the speculations of his predecessors, fills a whole volume with unanswerable arguments, tending to show that the locality of hell is in the sun. We suspect that the reverend speculator had read the apocalypse in bed, and had the nightmare in consequence. 
There are two verses in the Revelation of John reading thus, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God. This is simply Pythagorean and Kabbalistic allegory. The idea is new neither with the above-mentioned author nor with John. Pythagoras placed the sphere of purification in the sun, which sun, with its sphere, he moreover. p. 13. Locates in the middle of the universe, the allegory having a double meaning. 1. Symbolically, the central, spiritual sun, the supreme deity. Arrived at this region every soul becomes purified of its sins, and unites itself forever with its spirit having previously suffered throughout all the lower spheres. 2. By placing the sphere of visible fire in the middle of the universe, he simply taught the heliocentric system which appertained to the mysteries, and was imparted only in the higher degree of initiation. John gives to his word a purely Kabbalistic significance, which no fathers, except those who had belonged to the Neoplatonic school, were able to comprehend. Origen understood it well, having been a pupil of Ammonius Saccas, Therefore we see him bravely denying the perpetuity of hell torments. He maintains that not only men, but even devils, by which term he meant disembodied human sinners, after a certain duration of punishment shall be pardoned and finally restored to heaven. In consequence of this and other such heresies origin was, as a matter of course, exiled. Many have been the learned and truly inspired speculations as to the locality of hell. The most popular were those which placed it in the center of the earth. At a certain time, however, skeptical doubts which disturbed the placidity of faith in this highly refreshing doctrine arose in consequence of the meddling scientists of those days. As a Mr. Swindon in our own century observes, the theory was inadmissible because of two objections. First, that a fund of fuel or sulfur sufficient to maintain so furious and constant a fire could not be there supposed, and, 2d, that it must want the nitrous particles in the air to sustain and keep it alive. And how, says he, can a fire be eternal, when, by degrees, the whole substance of the earth must be consumed thereby? The skeptical gentleman had evidently forgotten that centuries ago St. Augustine solved the difficulty. Have we not the word of this learned divine that hell, nevertheless, is in the center of the earth, for God supplies the central fire with air by a miracle? The argument is unanswerable, and so we will not seek to upset it. The Christians were the first to make the existence of Satan a dogma of the church. And once that she had established it, she had to struggle for over 1,700 years for the repression of a mysterious force which it was her policy to make appear of diabolical origin. Unfortunately, in manifesting itself, this force invariably tends to upset such a belief by the ridiculous discrepancy it presents between the alleged cause and the effects. If the clergy have not overestimated the real power of p. 14. The archenemy of God, it must be confessed that he takes mighty precautions against being recognized as the prince of darkness who aims at our souls. If modern spirits are devils at all, as preached by the clergy, then they can only be those poor or stupid devils whom Max Muller describes as appearing so often in the German and Norwegian tales. Notwithstanding this, the clergy fear above all to be forced to relinquish this hold on humanity. They are not willing to let us judge of the tree by its fruits, for that might sometimes force them into dangerous dilemmas. They refuse, likewise, to admit, with unprejudiced people, that the phenomena of spiritualism has unquestionably spiritualized, and reclaim from evil courses many an indomitable atheist and skeptic. But, as they confess themselves, what is the use in a pope, if there is no devil? And so Rome sends her ablest advocates and preachers to the rescue of those perishing in the bottomless pit. Rome employs their cleverest writers for this purpose albeit they all indignantly deny the accusation and in the preface to every book put forth by the prolific de Musos, the French Tertullian of our century, we find undeniable proofs of the fact. Among other certificates of ecclesiastical approval, every volume is ornamented with the text of a certain original letter addressed to the very pious author by the world-known Father Ventura de Relica, of Rome. Few are those who have not heard this famous name. It is the name of one of the chief pillars of the Latin Church, the ex-general of the Order of the Theatins, consultor of the Sacred Congregation of Rites, examiner of bishops, and of the Roman clergy, etc., etc., etc. This strikingly characteristic document will remain to astonish future generations by its spirit of unsophisticated demonolatry and unblushing sincerity. We translate a fragment verbatim, and by thus helping its circulation hope to merit the blessings of Mother Church. Monsieur an excellent friend. 
The greatest victory of Satan was gained on that day when he succeeded in making himself denied. To demonstrate the existence of Satan, is to re-establish one of the fundamental dogmas of the Church, which serve as a basis for Christianity, and, without which, Satan would be but a name. Magic, mesmerism, magnetism, somnambulism, spiritualism, spiritism, hypnotism, are only other names for Satanism. To bring out such a truth and show it in its proper light, is to unmask the enemy, it is to unveil the immense danger of certain practices, reputed innocent, it is to deserve well in the eyes of humanity and of religion. Father Ventura de Rolica. P. 15. Amen. This is an unexpected honor indeed, for our American controls in general, and the innocent Indian guides in particular. To be thus introduced in Rome as princes of the Empire of Iblis, is more than they could ever hope for in other lands. Without in the least suspecting that she was working for the future welfare of her enemies the spiritualists and spiritists the church, some twenty years since, in tolerating Dame Musos and de Merval as the biographers of the devil, and giving her approbation thereto, tacitly confessed the literary co-partnership. M. The Chevalier Gaugenot de Musos, and his friend and collaborator, the Marquis of de Merval, to judge by their long titles, must be aristocrats piercing, and they are, moreover, writers of no small erudition and talent. Were they to show themselves a little more parsimonious of double points of exclamation following every vituperation, and invective against Satan and his worshippers, their style would be faultless. As it is, the crusade against the enemy of mankind was fierce, and lasted for over twenty years. What with the Catholics piling up their psychological phenomena to prove the existence of a personal devil, and the Count de Gasparin, an ancient minister of Louis Philippe, collecting volumes of other facts to prove the contrary, the spiritists of France have contracted an everlasting debt of gratitude toward the disputants. The existence of an unseen spiritual universe peopled with invisible beings has now been demonstrated beyond question. Ransacking the oldest libraries, they have distilled from the historical records the quintessence of evidence. All epics, from the Homeric ages down to the present day, have supplied their choicest materials to these indefatigable authors. In trying to prove the authenticity of the miracles wrought by Satan in the days preceding the Christian era, as well as throughout the Middle Ages, they have simply laid a firm foundation for a study of the phenomena in our modern times. Though an ardent, uncompromising enthusiast, De Musos unwittingly transforms himself into the tempting demon, or as he is fond of calling the devil the serpent of Genesis. In his desire to demonstrate in every manifestation the presence of the evil one, he only succeeds in demonstrating that spiritualism and magic are no new things in the world, but very ancient twin brothers, whose origin must be sought for in the earliest infancy of ancient India, Chaldea, Babylonia, Egypt, Persia, and Greece. He proves the existence of spirits, whether these be angels or devils, with such a clearness of argument and logic, in such an amount. p. 16. Of evidence, historical, irrefutable and strictly authenticated, that little is left for spiritualist authors who may come after him. How unfortunate that the scientists, who believe neither in devil nor spirit, are more than likely to ridicule M. de Musos's books without reading them, for they really contain so many facts of profound scientific interest. But what can we expect in our own age of unbelief, when we find Plato, over twenty-two centuries ago, complaining of the same? Me, too, says he, in his euthyphron, when I say anything in the public assembly concerning divine things, and predict to them what is going to happen, they ridicule as mad, and although nothing that I have predicted has proved untrue, yet they envy all such men as we are. However, we ought not to heed, but pursue our own way. The literary resources of the Vatican and other Catholic repositories of learning must have been freely placed at the disposal of these modern authors. When one has such treasures at hand original manuscripts, papyri, and books pillaged from the richest heathen libraries, old treatises on magic and alchemy, and records of all the trials for witchcraft, and sentences for the same direct, stake, and torture, it is mighty easy to write volumes of accusations against the devil. We affirm on good grounds that there are hundreds of the most valuable works on the occult sciences, which are sentenced to eternal concealment from the public, but are attentively read and studied by the privileged who have access to the Vatican Library. The laws of nature are the same for heathen sorcerer as for Catholic saint, and a miracle may be produced as well by one as by the other, without the slightest intervention of God or devil. Hardly had the manifestations begun to attract attention in Europe, 
and the clergy commenced their outcry that their traditional enemy had reappeared under another name, and divine miracles also began to be heard of in isolated instances. First they were confined to humble individuals, some of whom claimed to have them produced through the intervention of the Virgin Mary, saints and angels, others according to the clergy began to suffer from obsession and possession, for the devil must have his share of fame as well as the deity. Finding that, notwithstanding the warning, the independent, or so-called spiritual phenomena went on increasing and multiplying, and that these manifestations threatened to upset the carefully constructed dogmas of the church, the world was suddenly startled by extraordinary intelligence. In 1864, a whole community became possessed of the devil. Morzine, and the awful stories of its demoniacs, valiers, and the narratives of its well-authenticated exhibitions of sorcery, and those of the praise be tear to side will curdle the blood in Catholic veins. Strange to say, the question has been asked over and over again. p. 17. Why the divine miracles and most of the obsessions are so strictly confined to Roman Catholic dioceses and countries? Why is it that since the Reformation there has been scarcely one single divine miracle in a Protestant land? Of course, the answer we must expect from Catholics is, that the latter are peopled by heretics, and abandoned by God. Then why are there no more church miracles in Russia, a country whose religion differs from the Roman Catholic faith but in external forms of rites, its fundamental dogma is being identically the same, except as to the emanation of the Holy Ghost? Russia has her accepted saints and thaumaturgical relics, and miracle-working images. The Saint Mitrophany of Voronegh is an authenticated miracle worker, but his miracles are limited to healing, and though hundreds upon hundreds have been healed through faith, and though the old cathedral is full of magnetic effluvia, and whole generations will go on believing in his power, and some persons will always be healed, still no such miracles are heard of in Russia as the Madonna walking, and Madonna letter writing, and statue talking of Catholic countries. Why is this so? Simply because the emperors have strictly forbidden that sort of thing. The Tsar, Peter the Great, stopped every spurious divine miracle with one frown of his mighty brow. He declared he would have no false miracles played by the holy icons, images of saints, and they disappeared forever. There are cases on record of isolated and independent phenomena exhibited by certain images in the last century. The latest was the bleeding of the cheek of an image of the Virgin, when a soldier of Napoleon cut her face in two. This miracle, alleged to have happened in 1812, in the days of the invasion by the Grand Army, was the final farewell. p. 18. But since then, although the three successive emperors have been pious men, their will has been respected, and the images and saints have remained quiet, and hardly been spoken of except as connected with religious worship. In Poland, a land of furious ultramontanism, there were, at different times, desperate attempts at miracle doing. They died at birth, however, for the Argosite police were there, a Catholic miracle in Poland, made public by the priests, generally meaning political revolution, bloodshed, and war. Is it then, not permissible to at least suspect that if, in one country divine miracles may be arrested by civil and military law, and in another they never occur, we must search for the explanation of the two facts in some natural cause, instead of attributing them to either God or devil? In our opinion if it is worth anything the whole secret may be accounted for as follows. In Russia, the clergy know better than to bewilder their parishes, whose piety is sincere and faith strong without miracles, they know that nothing is better calculated than the latter to sow seeds of distrust, doubt, and finally of skepticism which leads directly to atheism. Moreover the climate is less propitious, and the magnetism of the average population too positive, too healthy, to call forth independent phenomena and fraud would not answer. On the other hand, neither in Protestant Germany, nor England, nor yet in America, since the days of the Reformation, has the clergy had access to any of the Vatican secret libraries. Hence they are all but poor hands at the magic of Albertus Magnus. As for America being overflowed with sensitives and mediums, the reason for it is partially attributable to climatic influence and especially to the physiological condition of the population. Since the days of the Salem witchcraft, 200 years ago, when the comparatively few settlers had pure and unadulterated blood in their veins, nothing much had been heard of spirits or mediums until 1840. The phenomena then first appeared among the ascetic and exalted Shakers, whose religious aspirations, peculiar mode of life, moral purity, and physical chastity all led to the production of independent phenomena of a psychological. p. 19. As well as physical nature, 
Hundreds of thousands, and even millions of men from various climates and of different constitutions and habits, have, since 1692, invaded North America, and by intermarrying have substantially changed the physical type of the inhabitants. Of what country in the world do the women's constitutions bear comparison with the delicate, nervous, and sensitive constitutions of the feminine portion of the population of the United States? We were struck on our arrival in the country with the semi-transparent delicacy of skin of the natives of both sexes. Compare a hard-working Irish factory girl or boy, with one from a genuine American family. Look at their hands. One works as hard as the other, they are of equal age, and both seemingly healthy, and still, while the hands of the one, after an hour's sobbing, will show a skin little softer than that of a young alligator, those of the other, notwithstanding constant use, will allow you to observe the circulation of the blood under the thin and delicate epidermis. No wonder, then, that while America is a conservatory of sensitives the majority of its clergy, unable to produce divine or any other miracles, stoutly deny the possibility of any phenomena except those produced by tricks and juggling. And no wonder also that the Catholic priesthood, who are practically aware of the existence of magic and spiritual phenomena, and believe in them while dreading their consequences, try to attribute the whole to the agency of the devil. Let us adduce one more argument, if only for the sake of circumstantial evidence. In what countries have divine miracles flourished most, been most frequent and most stupendous? Catholic Spain, and Pontifical Italy, beyond question. In which more than these two, has had access to ancient literature? Spain was famous for her libraries, the Moors were celebrated for their profound learning in alchemy and other sciences. The Vatican is the storehouse of an immense number of ancient manuscripts. During the long interval of nearly 1,500 years they have been accumulating, from trial after trial, books and manuscripts confiscated from their sentence victims, to their own profit. The Catholics may plead that the books were generally committed to the flames, that the treatises of famous sorcerers and enchanters perished with their accursed authors. But the Vatican, if it could speak, could tell a different story. It knows too well of the existence of certain closets and rooms, access to which is had but by the very few. It knows that the entrances to these secret hiding places are so cleverly concealed from sight in the carved framework and under the profuse ornamentation of the library walls, that there have even been popes who lived and died within the precincts of the palace without ever suspecting their existence. But these popes were neither Sylvester II, Benedict IX, John XX, nor P. XX, the sixth and seventh Gregory, nor yet the famous Borgie of toxicological memory. Neither were those who remained ignorant of the hidden lore friends of the sons of Loyola. Where, in the records of European magic, can we find clever enchanters than in the mysterious solitudes of the cloister? Albert Magnus, the famous bishop and conjurer of Ratisbon, was never surpassed in his art. Roger Bacon was a monk, and Thomas Aquinas one of the most learned pupils of Albertus. Trithemius, abbot of the Spanheim Benedictines, was the teacher, friend, and confidant of Cornelius Agrippa, and while the confederations of the Theosophists were scattered broadcast about Germany, where they first originated, assisting one another, and struggling for years for the acquirement of esoteric knowledge, any person who knew how to become the favored pupil of certain monks, might very soon be proficient in all the important branches of occult learning. This is all in history and cannot be easily denied. Magic, in all its aspects, was widely and nearly openly practiced by the clergy till the Reformation and even he who was once called the father of the Reformation, the famous John Reuschling, author of the mythic word and friend of Pico di Mirandola, the teacher and instructor of Erasmus, Luther, and Melanchthon, was a Kabbalist and a cultist. The ancient sortilegium, or divination by means of sorties or lots in art and practice now decried by the clergy as an abomination, designated by stat. 10 Jack. As felony, and by stat. 12 Carolus too accepted out of the general pardons, on the ground of being sorcery was widely practiced by the clergy and monks. Nay, it was sanctioned by St. Augustine himself, who does not disapprove of this method of learning futurity, provided it be not used for worldly purposes. More than that, he confesses having practiced it himself. I, what the clergy called it sorti sanctorum, when it was they who practiced it, while the sorties prenestini, succeeded by the sorties homerici and sorties virgiliani, were abominable heathenism, the worship of the devil, when used by anyone else. Gregory de Tours informs us that when the clergy resorted to the sorties their custom was to lay the Bible on the altar, and to pray the Lord that he would discover his will, 
and disclosed to them futurity in one of the verses of the book. Gilbert de Nogent writes that in his days, p. 21, about the 12th century, the custom was, at the consecration of bishops, to consult the sortie sanctorum, to thereby learn the success and fate of the episcopate. On the other hand, we are told that the sortie sanctorum were condemned by the Council of Ogda, in 506. In this case again we are left to inquire, in which instance has the infallibility of the church failed? Was it when she prohibited that which was practiced by her greatest saint and patron, Augustine, or in the twelfth century, when it was openly and with the sanction of the same church practiced by the clergy for the benefit of the bishop's elections? Or, must we still believe that in both of these contradictory cases the Vatican was inspired by the direct spirit of God? If any doubt that Gregory of Tours approved of a practice that prevails to this day, more or less, even among strict Protestants, let them read this, Lendistus, Earl of Tours, who was for ruining me with Queen Fredegonde, coming to Tours, big with evil designs against me, I withdrew to my oratory under a deep concern, where I took the psalms, my heart revived within me when I cast my eyes on this of the seventy-seventh psalm, he caused them to go on with confidence, whilst the sea swallowed up their enemies. Accordingly, the Count spoke not a word to my prejudice, and leaving Tours that very day, the boat in which he was, sunk in a storm, but his skill in swimming saved him. The sainted bishop simply confesses here to having practiced a bit of sorcery. Every mesmerizer knows the power of enduring an intense desire bent on any particular subject. Whether in consequence of coincidence or otherwise, the open verse suggested to his mind revenge by drowning. Passing the remainder of the day in deep concern, and possessed by this all-absorbing thought, the saint in may be unconsciously exercises his will on the subject, and thus while imagining in the accident the hand of God, he simply becomes a sorcerer exercising his magnetic will which reacts on the person feared, and the count barely escapes with his life. Were the accident decreed by God, the culprit would have been drowned, for a simple bath could not have altered his malevolent resolution against St. Gregory had he been very intent on it. Furthermore, we find an ephemus fulminated against this lottery of fate, at the Council of Vars, which forbids all ecclesiastics, under pain of excommunication, to perform that kind of divination, or to pry into futurity, by looking into any book, or writing, whatsoever. The same prohibition is pronounced at the councils of Ogden in 506, of Orleans, in 511, of Auxerre in 595, and finally at the Council of Enum in 1110, the latter condemning sorcerers, which is, diviners, such as occasion death by magical operations, and who practice fortune-telling by the p. 22. Holy Book Lots, in the complaint of the joint clergy against de Groland, their bishop at Orleans, and address to Pope Alexander III, concludes in this manner, Let your apostolical hands put on strength to strip naked the iniquity of this man, that the curse prognosticated on the day of his consecration may overtake him, for the gospels being opened on the altar according to custom, the first words were, and the young man, leaving his linen cloth, fled from them naked. Why then roast the lay magicians and consulters of books, and canonize the ecclesiastics? Simply because the medieval as well as the modern phenomena, manifested through laymen, whether produced through occult knowledge or happening independently, upset the claims of both the Catholic and Protestant churches to divine miracles. In the face of reiterated and unimpeachable evidence it became impossible for the former to maintain successfully the assertion that seemingly miraculous manifestations by the good angels and God's direct intervention could be produced exclusively by our chosen ministers and holy saints. Neither could the Protestant well maintain on the same ground that miracles had ended with the apostolic ages. For, whether of the same nature or not, the modern phenomena claim close kinship with the biblical ones. The magnetists and healers of our century came into direct and open competition with the apostles. The Zouave Jacob, of France, had outrivaled the prophet Elijah in recalling to life persons who were seemingly dead, and Alexis, the somnambulist, mentioned by Mr. Wallace in his work, was, by his lucidity, putting to shame apostles, prophets, and the sibyls of old. Since the burning of the last witch, the great revolution of France, so elaborately prepared by the League of the Secret Societies and their clever emissaries, had blown over Europe and awakened terror in the bosom of the clergy. It had, like a destroying hurricane, swept away in its course those best allies of the Church, the Roman Catholic aristocracy. A sure foundation was now laid for the right of individual opinion. The world was freed from ecclesiastical tyranny by opening an unobstructed path to Napoleon the Great, who had given the death blow to the Inquisition. 
This great slaughterhouse of the Christian church wherein she butchered, in the name of the Lamb, all the sheep arbitrarily declared scurvy was in ruins, and she found herself left to her own responsibility and resources. So long as the phenomena had appeared only sporadically, she had always felt herself powerful enough to repress the consequences. Superstition p. 23. And belief in the devil were as strong as ever, and science had not yet dared to publicly measure her forces with those of supernatural religion. Meanwhile the enemy had slowly but surely gained ground. All at once it broke out with an unexpected violence. Miracles began to appear in full daylight, and passed from their mystic seclusion into the domain of natural law, where the profane hand of science was ready to strip off their sacerdotal mask. Still, for a time, the church held her position, and with the powerful help of superstitious fear checked the progress of the intruding force. But, when in succession appeared mesmerists and somnambulists, reproducing the physical and mental phenomenon of ecstasy, hitherto believed to be the special gift of saints, when the passion for the turning tables had reached in France and elsewhere its climax of fury, when the psychography alleged spiritual from a simple curiosity had developed itself and settled into an unabated interest, and finally ebbed into religious mysticism, when the echoes aroused by the first raps of Rochester, crossing the oceans, spread until they were repercussed from nearly every corner of the world then, and only then, the Latin church was fully awakened to a sense of danger. Wonder after wonder was reported to have occurred in the spiritual circles in the lecture rooms of the mesmerists, the sick were healed, the blind made to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear. J. R. Newton in America, and Du Petit in France, were healing the multitude without the slightest claim to divine intervention. The great discovery of Mesmer, which reveals to the earnest inquirer the mechanism of nature, mastered, as if by magical power, organic and inorganic bodies. But this was not the worst. A more direful calamity for the church occurred in the evocation from the upper and nether worlds of a multitude of spirits, whose private bearing and conversation gave the direct lie to the most cherished and profitable dogmas of the church. These spirits claimed to be the identical entities, in a disembodied state, of fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters, friends and acquaintances of the persons viewing the weird phenomena. The devil seemed to have no objective existence, and this struck at the very foundation upon which the chair of St. Peter rested. Not a spirit except the mocking man. p. 24. Kins of Planchette would confess to the most distant relationship with the satanic majesty, or accredit him with the governorship of a single inch of territory. The clergy felt their prestige growing weaker every day, as they saw the people impatiently shaking off, in the broad daylight of truth, the dark veils with which they had been blindfolded for so many centuries. Then finally, fortune, which previously had been on their side in the long-wage conflict between theology and science, deserted to their adversary. The help of the latter to the study of the occult side of nature was truly precious and timely, and science has unwittingly widened the once narrow path of the phenomena into a broad highway. Had not. p. 25. This conflict culminated at the nick of time, we might have seen reproduced on a miniature scale the disgraceful scenes of the episodes of Salem witchcraft in the nuns of Loudon. As it was, the clergy were muzzled. But if science has unintentionally helped the progress of the occult phenomena, the latter have reciprocally aided science herself. Until the days when newly reincarnated philosophy boldly claimed its place in the world, there had been but few scholars who had undertaken the difficult task of studying comparative theology. This science occupies a domain heretofore penetrated by few explorers. The necessity which it involved of being well acquainted with the dead languages, necessarily limited the number of students. Besides, there was less popular need for it so long as people could not replace the Christian orthodoxy by something more tangible. It is one of the most undeniable facts of psychology, that the average man can as little exist out of a religious element of some kind, as a fish out of the water. The voice of truth, a voice stronger than the voice of the mightiest thunder, speaks to the inner man in the 19th century of the Christian era, as it spoke in the corresponding century BC it is a useless and unprofitable task to offer to humanity the choice between a future life and annihilation. The only chance that remains for those friends of human progress who seek to establish for the good of mankind a faith, henceforth stripped entirely of superstition. p. 26. And dogmatic fetters is to address them in the words of Joshua, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. The science of religion, wrote Max Muller in 1860, 
is only just beginning. During the last 50 years the authentic documents of the most important religions in the world have been recovered in a most unexpected and almost miraculous manner. We have now before us the canonical books of Buddhism, the Zen Avesta of Zoroaster is no longer a sealed book, and the hymns of the Rigveda have revealed a state of religions anterior to the first beginnings of that mythology which in Homer and Hesiod stands before us as a moldering ruin. In their insatiable desire to extend the dominion of blind faith, the early architects of Christian theology had been forced to conceal, as much as it was possible, the true sources of the same. To this end they are said to have burned or otherwise destroyed all the original manuscripts on the Kabbalah, magic, and occult sciences upon which they could lay their hands. They ignorantly supposed that the most dangerous writings of this class had perished with the last Gnostic, but some day they may discover their mistake. Other authentic and as important documents will perhaps reappear in a most unexpected and almost miraculous manner. p. 27. There are strange traditions current in various parts of the eastern Mount Athos and in the desert of Nitria, for instance among certain monks, and with learned rabbis in Palestine, who pass their lives in commenting upon the Talmud. They say that not all the rolls and manuscripts, reported in history to have been burned by Caesar, by the Christian mob, in 389, and by the Arab general Amru, perish as it is commonly believed, and the story they tell is the following, at the time of the contest for the throne, in 51 BC, between Cleopatra and her brother Dionysius Ptolemy, the Brookian, which contained over 700,000 rolls, all bound in wood and fireproof parchment, was undergoing repairs, and a great portion of the original manuscripts, considered among the most precious, and which were not duplicated, were stored away in the house of one of the librarians. As the fire which consumed the rest was but the result of accident, no precautions had been taken at the time. But they add, that several hours passed between the burning of the fleet, set on fire by Caesar's order, and the moment when the first buildings situated near the harbor caught fire in their turn, and that all the librarians, aided by several hundred slaves attached to the museum, succeeded in saving the most precious of the rolls. So perfect and solid was the fabric of the parchment, that while in some rolls the inner pages in the wood binding were reduced to ashes, of others the parchment binding remained unscorched. These particulars were all written out in Greek, Latin, in the Chaldeo-Syriac dialect, by a learned youth named Theodas, one of the scribes employed in the museum. One of these manuscripts is alleged to be preserved till now in Greek comment, and the person who narrated the tradition to us had seen it himself. He said that many more will see and learn where to look for important documents, when a certain prophecy will be fulfilled, adding, that most of these works could be found in Tartary in India. The monk showed us a copy of the original, which, of course, we could read but poorly, as we claim but little erudition in the matter of dead languages. But we were so particularly struck by the p. 28. The vivid and picturesque translation of the Holy Father, that we perfectly remember some curious paragraphs, which run, as far as we can recall them, as follows, when the Queen of the Sun, Cleopatra, was brought back to the half-ruined city, after the fire had devoured the glory of the world, and when she saw the mountains of books or rolls covering the half-consumed steps of the Estrada, and when she perceived that the inside was gone and the indestructible covers alone remained, she wept in rage and fury, and cursed the meanness of her fathers who had grudged the cost of the real Pergamus for the inside as well as the outside of the precious rolls. Further, our author, Diades, indulges in a joke at the expense of the queen for believing that nearly all the library was burned, when, in fact, hundreds and thousands of the choicest books were safely stored in his own house and those of other scribes, librarians, students, and philosophers. No more do sundry very learned cops scattered all over the East and Asia Minor, Egypt, and Palestine believe in the total destruction of the subsequent libraries. For instance, they say that out of the library of Atlas III, of Pergamus, presented by Antony to Cleopatra, not a volume was destroyed. At that time, according to their assertions, from the moment that the Christians began to gain power in Alexandria about the end of the 4th century in Anatolius, Bishop of Laodicea, began to insult the national gods, the pagan philosophers and learned theurgists adopted effective measures to preserve the repositories of their sacred learning. Theophilus, a bishop, who left behind him the reputation of a most rascally and mercenary villain, was accused by one named Antoninus, a famous theurgist and eminent scholar of occult science of Alexandria, with bribing the slaves of the Serapian to steal books which he sold to foreigners at great prices. History tells us how Theophilus had the best of the philosophers, in 8389, and how his successor and nephew, 
the no less infamous Cyril, butchered Hypatia. Suidas gives us some details about Antoninus, whom he calls Antonius, and his eloquent friend Olympus, the defender of the Serapian. But history is far from being complete in the miserable remnants of books, which, crossing so many ages, have reached our own learned century, it fails to give the facts relating to the first five centuries of Christianity which are preserved in the numerous traditions current in the East. Unauthenticated as these may appear, there is unquestionably in the heap of chaff much good grain. That these traditions are not often or communicated to Europeans is not strange, when we consider how apt our travelers are to render themselves antagonistic to the natives by their skeptical bearing and, occasionally, dogmatic intolerance. One exceptional man like some archaeologists, who knew how to win the p. 29. Confidence and even friendship of certain Arabs, are favored with precious documents, it is declared simply a coincidence. And yet there are widespread traditions of the existence of certain subterranean, and immense galleries, in the neighborhood of Ishmonia the petrified city, in which are stored numberless manuscripts and rolls. For no amount of money would the Arabs go near it. At night, they say, from the crevices of the desolate ruins, sunk deep in the unwatered sands of the desert, stream the rays from lights carried to and fro in the galleries by no human hands. The Ephrides study the literature of the antediluvian ages, according to their belief, and the jinn learns from the magic rolls the lesson of the following day. The Encyclopedia Britannica, in its article on Alexandria, says, when the temple of Serapis was demolished, the valuable library was pillaged or destroyed, and twenty years afterwards the empty shelves excited the regret, etc. But it does not state the subsequent fate of the pillaged books. In rivalry of the fierce merry worshippers of the fourth century, the modern clerical persecutors of liberalism and heresy would willingly shut up all the heretics in their books in some modern Serapian and burn them alive. The cause of this hatred is natural. Modern research has more than ever unveiled the secret. Is not the worship of saints and angels now, said Bishop Newton, years ago, in all respects the same that the worship of demons was in former times? The name only is different, the thing is identically the same, the very same temples, the very same images, which were once consecrated to Jupiter and the other demons, are now consecrated to the Virgin Mary and other saints, the whole of paganism is converted and applied to popery. Why not be impartial and add that a good portion of it was adopted by Protestant religions also? The very apostolic designation Peter is from the mysteries. The Hierophant or Supreme Pontiff bore the Chaldean title Peter, or Interpreter. The names the Pether, the residents of Balaam, Patara, and Petras, the names of oracle cities, Patras or Potteras and, perhaps, p. 30. Buddha, all come from the same root. Jesus says, Upon this Petra I will build my church, and the gates, or rulers of Hades, shall not prevail against it, meaning by Petra the rock temple, and by metaphor, the Christian mysteries, the adversaries to which were the old mystery gods of the underworld, who were worshipped in the rites of Isis, Adonis, Adis, Sabazius, Dionysus, and the Eleusinia. No apostle Peter was ever at Rome, but the Pope, seizing the scepter of the Pontifex Maximus, the keys of Janus and Kubel, and adorning his Christian head with the cap of the Mognomator, copied from that of the tiara of Brahmatma, the supreme pontiff of the initiates of old India, became the successor of the pagan high priest, the real Peter Roma, or Petroma. The Roman Catholic Church has two far mightier enemies than the heretics and the infidels, and these are comparative mythology and philology. When such eminent divines as the Reverend James Freeman Clark go so much out of their way to prove to their readers that critical theology from the time of Origen and Jerome, and the controversial theology during fifteen centuries, has not consisted in accepting on authority the opinions of other people, but has shown, on the contrary, much acute and comprehensive reasoning. We can but regret that so much scholarship should have been wasted in attempting to prove that which a fair survey of the history of theology upsets at every step. In these controversies and critical treatment of the doctrines of the Church one can certainly find any amount of acute reasoning, but far more of a still acuter sophistry. Recently the mass of cumulative evidence has been reinforced to an extent which leaves little, if any, room for further controversy. A conclusive opinion is furnished by too many scholars to doubt the fact that India was the alma mater, not only of the civilization, arts, and sciences, but also of all the great religions of antiquity, Judaism, and hence Christianity, included. Herder places the cradle of humanity in India, 
and shows Moses as a clever and relatively modern compiler of the ancient Brahmanical traditions. The river which encircles the country, India, is the sacred Ganges, which all Asia considers as the paradisaical river. There, also, is the biblical Gahon, which is none else but the Indus. The Arabs call it so unto this day, and the names of the countries watered by it are yet existing among the Hindus. Jocalio claims to have translated every ancient palm leaf manuscript which he had the fortune of being allowed by the Brahmins of the pagodas to see. In one of his p. 31. Translations, we found passages which reveal to us the undoubted origin of the keys of St. Peter, and account for the subsequent adoption of the symbol by their holinesses, the popes of Rome. He shows us, on the testimony of the Agrachata Parichai, which he freely translates as the Book of Spirits, Petrus, that centuries before our era the initiates of the temple chose a superior council, presided over by the Brahm Atma or supreme chief of all these initiates. That this pontificate, which could be exercised only by Abraham who had reached the age of eighty years, that the Brahm Atma was sole guardian of the mystic formula, resume of every science, contained in the three mysterious letters, which signify creation, conservation, and transformation. He alone could expound its meaning in the presence of the initiates of the third and supreme degree. Whomsoever among these initiates revealed to or profane a single one of the truths, even the smallest of the secrets entrusted to his care, was put to death. He who received the confidence had to share his fate. Finally, to crown this able system, said Jacolio, there existed a word still more superior to the mysterious monosyllable AUM, and which rendered him who came into the possession of its key nearly the equal of Brahma himself. The Brahm Atma alone possessed this key, and transmitted it in a sealed casket to his successor. This unknown word, of which no human power could, even today, when the Brahmanical authority has been crushed under the Mongolian and European invasions, today, when each pagoda has its Brahm Atma forced to disclosure, was engraved in a golden triangle and preserved in a sanctuary of the temple of Asgartha, whose Brahm Atma alone held the keys. He also bore upon his tiara two cross keys supported by two kneeling Brahmins, symbol of the precious deposit of which he had the keeping. This word and this triangle were engraved upon the tablet of the ring that this religious chief wore as one of the signs of his dignity, it was also framed in a golden sun on the altar, where every morning the supreme pontiff offered the sacrifice of the Sarvamita, or sacrifice to all the forces of nature. p. 32. Is this clear enough? And will the Catholics still maintain that it was the Brahmins of four thousand years ago who copied the ritual, symbols, and dress of the Roman pontiffs? We would not feel in the least surprised. Without going very far back into antiquity for comparisons, if we only stop at the 4th and 5th centuries of our era, and contrast the so-called heathenism of the 3rd Neoplatonic Eclectic School with the growing Christianity, the result may not be favorable to the latter. Even at that early period, when the new religion had hardly outlined its contradictory dogmas, when the champions of the bloodthirsty Cyril knew not themselves whether Mary was to become the mother of God, or rank as a demon in company with Isis, when the memory of the meek and lowly Jesus still lingered lovingly in every Christian heart and his words of mercy and charity vibrated still in the air, even then the Christians were outdoing the pagans in every kind of ferocity and religious intolerance. And if we look still farther back, and seek for examples of true Christism, in ages when Buddhism had hardly superseded Brahmanism in India, and the name of Jesus was only to be pronounced three centuries later, what do we find? Which of the holy pillars of the church has ever elevated himself to the level of religious tolerance and noble simplicity of character of some heathen? Compare, for instance, the Hindu Asoka, who lived 300 BC, and the Carthaginian Saint Augustine, who flourished three centuries after Christ. According to Max Muller, this is what is found engraved on the rocks of Girnar, Dali, and Copperdidri. Piotasi, the king beloved of the gods, desires that the ascetics of all creeds might reside in all places. All these ascetics profess alike the command which people should exercise over themselves, and the purity of the soul. But people have different opinions and different inclinations. And here is what Augustine wrote after his baptism, Wondrous depth of thy words. Whose surface, behold, is before us, inviting to little ones, yet are they a wondrous depth, O oh my God, a wondrous depth. It is awful to look therein, yes, an awfulness of honor, and a trembling of love. Thy enemies, read pagans, thereof I hate vehemently, O, oh, that thou wouldst slay them with thy two-edged sword that they might no longer be enemies to it, for so do I love to have them slain. 
wonderful spirit of Christianity, and that from a mannequin converted to the religion of one who even on his cross prayed for his enemies. p. 33. Who the enemies of the Lord were, according to the Christians, is not difficult to surmise, the few inside the Augustinian fold were his new children and favorites, who had supplanted in his affections the sons of Israel, his chosen people. The rest of mankind were his natural foes. The teeming multitudes of heathenim were proper food for the flames of hell, the handful within the church communion, heirs of salvation. But if such a prescriptive policy was just, and its enforcement was sweet savor in the nostrils of the Lord, why not scorn also the pagan rites in philosophy? Why draw so deep from the wells of wisdom, dug and filled up to bring by the same heathen? Or did the fathers, in their desire to imitate the chosen people whose time-worn shoes they were trying to fit upon their feet, contemplate the reenaction of the spoliation scene of the Exodus? Did they propose, in fleeing from heathenism as the Jews did from Egypt, to carry off the valuables of its religious allegories, as the chosen ones did the gold and silver ornaments? It certainly does seem as if the events of the first centuries of Christianity were but the reflection of the images thrown upon the mirror of the future at the time of the Exodus. During the stormy days of irony is the Platonic philosophy, with its mystical submersion into deity, was not so obnoxious after all to the new doctrine as to prevent the Christians from helping themselves to its abstruse metaphysics in every way and manner. Allying themselves with the ascetical therapeutic forefathers and models of the Christian monks and hermits, it was in Alexandria, let it be remembered, that they laid the first foundations of the purely Platonic Trinitarian doctrine. It became the plato philonian doctrine later, and such as we find it now. Plato considered the divine nature under a threefold modification of the first cause the reason or logos, and the soul or spirit of the universe. The three archaeal or original principles, says Gibbon, were represented in the Platonic system as three gods, united with each other by a mysterious and ineffable generation. Blending this transcendental idea with the more hypostatic figure of the logos of Philo, whose doctrine was that of the oldest Kabbalah, and who viewed the King Messiah, as the Metatron, or the Angel of the Lord, the Logatus descended in flesh, but not the Ancient of Days himself, the Christians clothed with this mythical representation of the mediator for the fallen race of Adam, Jesus, the son of Mary. Under this unexpected garb his personality was all but lost. In the modern Jesus of the Christian church, we find the ideal of the imaginative Irenaeus, not the adept. p. 34. Of the Essenes, the obscure reformer from Galilee. We see him under the disfigured plato philonian mask, not as the disciples heard him on the mount. So far then the heathen philosophy had helped them in the building of the principal dogma. But when the theurgists of the third Neoplatonic school, deprived of their ancient mysteries, strove to blend the doctrines of Plato with those of Aristotle, and by combining the two philosophies added to their theosophy the primeval doctrines of the Oriental Kabbalah, then the Christians from rivals became persecutors. Once that the metaphysical allegories of Plato were being prepared to be discussed in public in the form of Grecian dialectics, all the elaborate system of the Christian trinity would be unraveled and the divine prestige completely upset. The eclectic school, reversing the order, had adopted the inductive method, and this method became its death knell. Of all things on earth, logic and reasonable explanations were the most hateful to the new religion of mystery, for they threatened to unveil the whole groundwork of the Trinitarian conception, to apprise the multitude of the doctrine of emanations, and thus destroy the unity of the whole. It could not be permitted, and it was not. History records the Christ-like means that were resorted to. The universal doctrine of emanations, adopted from time immemorial by the greatest schools which taught the Kabbalistic, Alexandrian, and Oriental philosophers, gives the key to that panic among the Christian fathers. That spirit of Jesuitism and clerical craft, which prompted Parkhurst, many centuries later, to suppress in his Hebrew lexicon the true meaning of the first word of Genesis, originated in those days of war against the expiring Neoplatonic and Eclectic school. The fathers had decided to pervert the meaning of the word daimon, and they dreaded above all to have the esoteric and true meaning of the word razit unveiled to the multitudes, for if once the true sense of the sentence, as well as that of the Hebrew word is, translated in the Septuagint angels, while it means emanations, were understood rightly, the mystery of the Christian trinity would have crumbled, carrying in its downfall the new religion into the same heap of ruins with the ancient mysteries. This is the true reason why dialecticians, as well as Aristotle himself, the prying philosopher, were ever obnoxious to Christian theology. Even Luther, while on his work of reform, 
feeling the ground insecure under his feet, notwithstanding that the dogmas had p. 35. Been reduced by him to their simplest expression, gave full vent to his fear and hatred for Aristotle. The amount of abuse he heaped upon the memory of the great logician can only be equaled never surpassed by the Pope's anathemas and invectives against the liberals of the Italian government. Compiled together, they might easily fill a copy of a new encyclopedia with models for monkish diatribes. Of course the Christian clergy can never get reconciled with a doctrine based on the application of strict logic to discursive reasoning. The number of those who have abandoned theology on this account has never been made known. They have asked questions and been forbidden to ask them, hence, separation, disgust, and often a despairing plunge into the abyss of atheism. The Orphean views of ether as chief medium between God and created matter were likewise denounced. The Orphic ether recalled too vividly the Archeus, the soul of the world, and the latter was in its metaphysical senses closely related to the emanations, being the first manifestation sephira, or divine light. And when could the latter be more feared than at that critical moment? Origen, Clemens Alexandrinus, Chalcidius, Methodius, and Maimonides, on the authority of the Targum of Jerusalem, the orthodox and greatest authority of the Jews, held that the first two words in the book of Genesis be razit, mean wisdom, or the principle, and that the idea of these words meaning in the beginning was never shared but by the profane, who were not allowed to penetrate any deeper into the esoteric sense of the sentence. Bozeber, and after him Godfrey Higgins, have demonstrated the fact. All things, says the Kabbalah, are derived from one great principle, and this principle is the unknown and invisible God. From him a substantial power immediately proceeds, which is the image of God, and the source of all subsequent emanations. This second principle sends forth, by the energy, or will and force, of emanation, other natures, which are more or less perfect, according to their different degrees of distance, in the scale of emanation, from the first source of existence, and which constitute different worlds, or orders of being, all united to the eternal power from which they proceed. Matter is nothing more than the most remote effect of the emanative energy of the deity. The material world receives its form from the immediate agency of powers far beneath the first source of being. Bozeberf makes St. Augustine the Manichaean say thus, and if by Raza we understand the active principle of the creation, instead of its beginning, in such a case we will clearly perceive that Moses never meant to say. P. 36. That heaven and earth were the first works of God. He only said that God created heaven and earth through the principle, who is his son. It is not the time he points to, but to the immediate author of the creation. Angels, according to Augustine, were created before the firmament, and according to the esoteric interpretation, the heaven and earth were created after that, evolving from the second principle or the logos the creative deity. The word principle, says Bolzebur, does not mean that the heaven and earth were created before anything else, for, to begin with, the angels were created before that, but that God did everything through his wisdom, which is his verbum, in which the Christian Bible named the beginning, thus adopting the exoteric meaning of the word abandoned to the multitudes. The Kabbalah of the Oriental as well as the Jewish shows that a number of emanations, the Jewish Sephiroth, issued from the first principle, the chief of which was wisdom. This wisdom is the logos of Philo, and Michael the chief of the Gnostic eons, it is the Ormos of the Persians, Minerva, goddess of wisdom, of the Greeks, who emanated from the head of Jupiter, and the second person of the Christian trinity. The early fathers of the church had not much to exert their imagination, they found a ready-made doctrine that had existed in every theogony for thousands of years before the Christian era. Their trinity is but the trio of Sephiroth, the first three Kabbalistic lights of which Moses Nachmanides Nach says, that they have never been seen by anyone there is not any defect in them, nor any disunion. The first eternal number is the Father, or the Chaldean primeval, invisible, and incomprehensible chaos, out of which proceeded the intelligible one. The Egyptian Phta, or the principle of light not the light itself, and the principle of life, though himself no life. The wisdom by which the Father created the heavens is the Son, or the Kabbalistic androgynous Adam Codman. The Son is at once the male Ra, or light of wisdom, prudence or intelligence, Sephira, the female part of himself, while from this dual being proceeds the third emanation, the Bana or reason, the second intelligence the Holy Ghost of the Christians. Therefore, strictly speaking, there is a tetractes or quaternary, consisting of the unintelligible first monad, and its triple emanation, which properly constitute our trinity. 
how then avoid perceiving at once, that had not the Christians purposely disfigured in their interpretation and translation the Mosaic Genesis to fit their own views, their religion, with its present dogmas, would have been impossible? The word Razit, once taught in its new sense of the principle and not the beginning, and the anathematized doctrine of emanations accepted, the position of the second Trinitarian personage. P. 37. Becomes untenable. 4. If the angels are the first divine emanations from the divine substance, and were in existence before the second principle, then the anthropomorphized sun is at best an emanation like themselves, and cannot be got hypostatically any more than our visible works are ourselves. That these metaphysical subtleties never entered into the head of the honest-minded, sincere Paul, is evident, as it is furthermore evident, that like all learned Jews he was well acquainted with the doctrine of emanations and never thought of corrupting it. How can anyone imagine that Paul identified the Son with the Father, when he tells us that God made Jesus a little lower than the angels, Hebrews 2, 9, and a little higher than Moses. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, Hebrews 3, 3, of whatever, or how many forgeries, interlined later in the Acts, the fathers are guilty we know not, but that Paul never considered Christ more than a man full of the Spirit of God is but too evident, and the arch was the Logos, and the Logos was adenate to the Theos. Wisdom, the first emanation of Ensof, the Protagonos, the Hypostasis, the Adam Codman of the Kabbalist, the Brahma of the Hindu, the Logos of Plato, and the beginning of St. John is the Razid, of the Book of Genesis. If rightly interpreted it overturns, as we have remarked, the whole elaborate system of Christian theology, for it proves that behind the creative deity, there was a higher god, a planner, an architect, and that the former was but his executive agent a simple power. They persecuted the Gnostics, murdered the philosophers, and burned the Kabbalists and the Masons, and when the day of the Great Reckoning arrives, and the light shines in darkness, what will they have to offer in the place of the departed, expired religion? What will they answer, these pretended monotheists, these worshippers and pseudo-servants of the one living God, to their Creator? How will they account for this long persecution of them who were the true followers of the Grand Megalister, the supreme great master of the Rosicrucians, the first of Masons? For he is the builder and architect of the temple of the universe, he is the Verbum Sapienti. Everyone knows, wrote the great Manichaean of the third century, Foista, that the Evangeliums were written neither by Jesus Christ. P. 38. Nor his apostles, but long after their time by some unknown persons, who, judging well that they would hardly be believed when telling of things they had not seen themselves, headed their narratives with the names of the apostles or of disciples contemporaneous with the latter. Commenting upon the subject, A. Franck, the learned Hebrew scholar of the Institute and translator of the Kabbalah, expresses the same idea. Are we not authorized, he asked, to view the Kabbalah as a precious remnant of religious philosophy of the Orient, which, transported into Alexandria, got mixed to the doctrine of Plato, and under the usurped name of Dionysius the Areopagite, Bishop of Athens, converted and consecrated by St. Paul, was thus enabled to penetrate into the mysticism of the medieval ages? Says Jacolio, what is then this religious philosophy of the Orient, which has penetrated into the mystic symbolism of Christianity? We answer, this philosophy, the traces of which we find among the Magians, the Chaldeans, the Egyptians, the Hebrew Kabbalists and the Christians, is none other than that of the Hindu Brahmins, the sectarians of the Petrus, or the spirits of the invisible worlds which surround us. But if the Gnostics were destroyed, the Gnosis, based on the secret science of sciences, still lives. It is the earth which helps the woman, and which is destined to open her mouth to swallow up medieval Christianity, the usurper and assassin of the great master's doctrine. The ancient Kabbalah, the Gnosis, or traditional secret knowledge, was never without its representatives in any age or country. The trinities of initiates, whether passed into history or concealed under the impenetrable veil of mystery, are preserved and impressed throughout the ages. They are known as Moses, Aholiab, and Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, as Plato, Philo, and Pythagoras, etc. At the Transfiguration we see them as Jesus, Moses, and Elias, the three tribes majesty, and three Kabbalists, Peter, James, and John whose revelation is the key to all wisdom. We found them in the twilight of Jewish history as Zoroaster, Abraham, and Terah, and later as Henoch, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Who, of those who ever studied the ancient philosophies, who understand intuitionally the grandeur of their conceptions, 
the boundless sublimity of their views of the unknown deity, can hesitate for a moment to give the preference to their doctrines over the incomprehensible dogmatic and contradictory theology of the hundreds of Christian sects. Who that ever read Plato unfathomed his Tau Omicron Omicron Nu, whom no person has seen except the Son, can doubt that Jesus was a disciple of the same. p. 39. Secret doctrine which had instructed the great philosopher? For, as we have shown before now, Plato never claimed to be the inventor of all that he wrote, but gave credit for it to Pythagoras, who, in his turn, pointed to the remote east as the source whence he derived his information and his philosophy. Colebrook shows that Plato confesses it in his epistles, and says that he has taken his teachings from ancient and sacred doctrines. Moreover, it is undeniable that the theologies of all the great nations dovetail together and show that each is a part of one stupendous whole. Like the rest of the initiates we see Plato taking great pains to conceal the true meaning of his allegories. Every time the subject touches the greater secrets of the Oriental Kabbalah, secret of the true cosmogony of the universe and of the ideal, pre-existing world, Plato shrouds his philosophy in the profoundest darkness. His Timaeus is so confused that no one but an initiate can understand the secret meaning. And Mosheim thinks that Philo has filled his works with passages directly contradicting each other for the sole purpose of concealing the true doctrine. For once we see a critic on the right track. And this very Trinitarian idea, as well as the so bitterly denounced doctrine of emanations, once their remotest origin? The answer is easy, and every proof is now at hand. In the sublime and profoundest of all philosophies, that of the universal wisdom religion, the first traces of which, historical research now finds in the old pre-Vedic religion of India. As the much-abused Jokaleo Wao remarks, it is not in the religious works of antiquity, such as the Vedas, the Zen Avesta, the Bible, that we have to search for the exact expression of the ennobling and sublime beliefs of those epics. The holy primitive syllable, composed of the three letters A, U, M, and which is contained in the Vedic Trimurti, Trinity, must be kept secret, like another triple Veda, says Manu, in Book 11, Sloka 265. Swayam Hova is the unrevealed deity, it is the being existent through and of itself, he is the central and immortal germ of all that exists in the universe. Three trinities emanate and are confounded in him, forming a supreme unity. These trinities, or the triple trimorti, are, the Nara, Nari, and Vradi the initial triad, the Agni, Vaya, and Surya the manifested triad, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the creative triad. Each of these triads becomes less metaphysical and more adapted to the vulgar intelligence as it descends. Thus the last becomes but the symbol and its concrete expression, the necessarianism of a purely meta. p. 40. Physical Conception Together with Swayam Huva, they are the ten Sephiroth of the Hebrew Kabbalists, the ten Indoprajapatis the Ensof of the former, answering to the great unknown, expressed by the mystic AUM of the latter. Says Franck, the translator of the Kabbalah. The ten Sephiroth are divided into three classes, each of them presenting to us the divinity under a different aspect the whole still remaining an indivisible trinity. The first three Sephiroth are purely intellectual and metaphysics, they express the absolute identity of existence and thought, and form what the modern Kabbalists call the intelligible world which is the first manifestation of God. The three that follow, make us conceive God in one of their aspects, as the identity of goodness and wisdom, and the other they show to us, in the supreme good, the origin of beauty and magnificence, and the creation. Therefore, they are named the virtues, or the sensible world. Finally, we learn, by the last three Sephiroth, that the universal providence, that the supreme artist is also absolute force, the all-powerful cause, and that, at the same time, this cause is the generative element of all that is. It is these last Sephiroth that constitute the natural world, or nature in its essence and in its active principle. Nature and Natrans this Kabbalistic conception is thus proved identical with that of the Hindu philosophy. Whoever reads Plato and his dialogue Timaeus, will find these ideas as faithfully re-echoed by the Greek philosopher. Moreover, the injunction of secrecy was as strict with the Kabbalists, as with the initiates of the Adida and the Hindi yogis. Close thy mouth, lest thou shouldst speak of this, the mystery, in thy heart, lest thou shouldst think aloud, and if thy heart has escaped thee, bring it back to its place, for such is the object of our alliance, Sefer Jezere, Book of Creation. This is a secret which gives death, close thy mouth lest thou shouldst reveal to the vulgar, 
Compress thy brain lest something should escape from it and fall outside, or grouch out a parichai. Truly the fate of many a future generation hung on a gossamer thread, in the days of the third and fourth centuries. Had not the emperor sent in 389 to Alexandria a rescript which was forced from him by the Christians for the destruction of every idol, our own century would never have had a Christian mythological pantheon of its own. Never. P. 41. Did the Neoplatonic school reach such a height of philosophy as when nearest its end? Uniting the mystic theosophy of old Egypt with the refined philosophy of the Greeks, nearer to the ancient mysteries of Thebes and Memphis than they had been for centuries, versed in the science of soothsaying and divination, as in the art of the Therapeutus, friendly with the acutest men of the Jewish nation, who were deeply imbued with the Zoroastrian ideas, the Neoplatonists tended to amalgamate the old wisdom of the Oriental Kabbalah with the more refined conceptions of the Occidental Theosophists. Notwithstanding the treason of the Christians, who saw fit, for political reasons, after the days of Constantine, to repudiate their tutors, the influence of the new Platonic philosophy is conspicuous in the subsequent adoption of dogmas, the origin of which can be traced but too easily to that remarkable school. Though mutilated and disfigured, they still preserve a strong family likeness, which nothing can obliterate. But, if the knowledge of the occult powers of nature opens the spiritual sight of man, enlarges his intellectual faculties, and leads him unerringly to a profounder veneration for the Creator, on the other hand ignorance, dogmatic narrow-mindedness, and a childish fear of looking to the bottom of things, invariably leads to fetish worship and superstition. When Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria, had openly embraced the cause of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, and had anthropomorphized her into Mary, the mother of God, and the Trinitarian controversy had taken place, from that moment the Egyptian doctrine of the emanation of the creative god out of Emeth began to be tortured in a thousand ways, until the councils had agreed upon the adoption of it as it now stands the disfigured ternary of the Kabbalistic Solomon and Philo. But as its origin was yet too evident, the word was no longer called the heavenly man, the primal Adam Codman, but became the Logos Christ, and was made as old as the ancient of the ancient, his father. The concealed wisdom became identical with its emanation, the divine thought, and made to be regarded co-equal and co-eternal with its first manifestation. If we now stop to consider another of the fundamental dogmas of Christianity, the doctrine of atonement, we may trace it as easily back to heathenism. This cornerstone of a church which had believed herself built on a firm rock for long centuries, is now excavated by science and proved to come from the Gnostics. Professor Draper shows it as hardly known in the days of Tertullian, and as having originated among the Gnostic heretics. We will not permit ourselves to contradict such a p. 42. Learned authority, farther than the state that it originated among them no more than their anointed Christos and Sophia. The former they modeled on the original of the King Messiah, the male principle of wisdom, and the latter on the third Sephiroth, from the Chaldean Kabbalah, and even from the Hindu Brahma and Sarah Asvati, and the pagan Dionysus and Demeter. And here we are on firm ground if it were only because it is now proved that the New Testament never appeared in its complete form, such as we find it now, till three hundred years after the period of apostles, and the Sohar and other Kabbalistic books are found to belong to the first century before our era, if not to be far older still. The Gnostics entertained many of the Essenian ideas, and the Essenes had their greater and minor mysteries at least two centuries before our era. There were the Asarim or Initiates, the descendants of the Egyptian Hierophants, in whose country they had been settled for several centuries before they were converted to Buddhistic monasticism by the missionaries of King Ahsoka, and amalgamated later with the earliest Christians, and they existed, probably, before the old Egyptian temples were desecrated and ruined in the incessant invasions of Persians, Greeks, and other conquering hordes. The Hierophants had their atonement enacted in the mystery of initiation ages before the Gnostics, or even the Essenes, had appeared. It was known among Hierophants as the baptism of blood, and was considered not as an atonement for the fall of man in Eden, but simply as an expiation for the past, present, and future sins of ignorant but nevertheless polluted mankind. The Hierophant had the option of either offering his pure and sinless life as a sacrifice for his race to the gods whom he hoped to rejoin, or an animal victim. The former depended entirely on their own will. At the last moment of the solemn new birth, the initiator passed the word to the initiated, and immediately after that the latter had a weapon placed in his right hand and was ordered to strike. This is the true origin of the Christian dogma of atonement. p. 43. Verily the Christs of the pre-Christian ages were many. 
but they died unknown to the world, and disappeared as silently and as mysteriously from the sight of man as Moses from the top of Pisgah, the mountain of Nebo, oracular wisdom, after he had laid his hands upon Joshua, who thus became full of the spirit of wisdom, i.e., initiated. Nor does the mystery of the Eucharist pertain to Christians alone. Godfrey Higgins proves that it was instituted many hundreds of years before the Paschal Supper, and says that the sacrifice of bread and p. 44. Wine was common to many ancient nations. Cicero mentions it in his works, and wonders at the strangeness of the rite. There had been an esoteric meaning attached to it from the first establishment of the mysteries, and the Eucharistia is one of the oldest rites of antiquity. With the higher fans it had nearly the same significance as with the Christians. Ceres was bread, and Bacchus was wine, the former meaning regeneration of life from the seed, and the latter the grape the emblem of wisdom and knowledge, the accumulation of the spirit of things, and the fermentation and subsequent strength of that esoteric knowledge being justly symbolized by wine. The mystery related to the drama of Eden, it is said to have been first taught by Janus, who was also the first to introduce in the temples the sacrifices of bread and wine in commemoration of the fall into generation as the symbol of the seed. I am the vine, and my father is the husbandman, says Jesus, alluding to the secret knowledge that could be imparted by him. I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The festival of the Eleusinian Mysteries began in the month of Bodromian, which corresponds with the month of September, the time of grape gathering, and lasted from the 15th to the 22 day of the month, seven days. The Hebrew festival of the Feast of Tabernacles began on the 15th and ended on the 22 d of the month of Ethanim, which Dunlap shows as derived from Adonim, Adonia, Atenim, Ethanim, and this feast is named in Exodus, 23. 16. The Feast of Ingatherings. All the men of Israel assembled unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh. Plutarch thinks the Feast of the Booths to be the Bacchic Rites, not the p. 45 the Eleusinian. Thus Bacchus was directly called upon, he says. The Sabazion worship was Sabbatic, the names Evius, or Hevius, and Luels are identical with Hivite and Levite. The French name Louis is the Hebrew Levi, Eucus again is Ea or Jehovah, and Baal or Adon, like Bacchus, was a phallic god. Who shall ascend into the hill, the high place, of the Lord? Ask the holy king David, who shall stand in the place of his Kadushu? Psalms 24. 3. Kadesh may mean in one sense to devote, hallow, sanctify, and even to initiate or to set apart, but it also means the ministers of lascivious rites, the Venus worship, and the true interpretation of the word Kadesh is bluntly rendered in Deuteronomy 23. 17. Hosea 4. 14. In Genesis 38, from verses 15 to 22. The holy cage youth of the Bible were identical as to the duties of their office with the notch girls of the later Hindu pagodas. The Hebrew cage or galley lived by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove, or bust of Venus Astarte, says verse the 7th and the 23rd chapter of 2 Kings. The dance performed by David round the ark was the circle dance said to have been prescribed by the Amazons for the mysteries. Such was the dance of the daughters of Shiloh, Judges 21. 21. 23 at Passim, and the leaping of the prophets of Baal, I Kings 18. 26. It was simply a characteristic of the Sabaean worship, for it denoted the motion of the planets round the sun. That the dance was a Bacchic frenzy is apparent. Sister were used on the occasion, and the taunt of Michael and the king's reply are very expressive. The king of Israel uncovered himself before his maidservants as one of the vain, or debauched, fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And he retorts, I will play, act wantonly, before, and I will be yet more vile than this, and I will be base in my own sight. When we remember that David had sojourned among the Tyrians and Philistines, where their rites were common, and that indeed he had conquered that land away from the house of Saul, by the aid of mercenaries from their country, the countenancing and even, perhaps, the introduction of such a pagan-like worship by the weak psalmist seems very natural. David knew nothing of Moses, it seems, and if he had introduced the Jehovah worship it was not in its monotheistic character, but simply as that of one of the many gods of the neighboring nations a tutelary deity to whom he had given the preference, and chosen among all other gods. Following the Christian dogma Syriatum, if we concentrate our attention upon one which provoked the fiercest battles until its recognition, that of the Trinity, what do we find? We meet it, as we have shown, northeast of the Indus, 
in tracing it to Asia Minor and Europe, recognize it among every people who had anything like an established religion. p. 46. It was taught in the oldest Chaldean, Egyptian, and Mithraic schools. The Chaldean sun god, Mithra, was called Triple, and the Trinitarian idea of the Chaldeans was a doctrine of the Akkadians, who, themselves, belonged to a race which was the first to conceive a metaphysical trinity. The Chaldeans are a tribe of the Akkadians, according to Rawlinson, who lived in Babylonia from the earliest times. They were Turanians, according to others, and instructed the Babylonians into the first notions of religion. But these same Akkadians, who were they? Those scientists who would ascribe to them a Turanian origin, make of them the inventors of the cuneiform characters, others call them Sumerians, others again, respectively, make their language, of which, for very good reasons, no traces would ever remain Chaldean, Chaldaic, Protocaldian, Kostu Scythic, and so on. The only tradition worthy of credence is that these Akkadians instructed the Babylonians in the mysteries, and taught them the sacerdotal or mystery language. These Akkadians were then simply a tribe of the Hindu Brahmins, now called Aryans their vernacular language, the Sanskrit of the Vedas, and the sacred or mystery language, that which, even in our own age, is used by the Hindu Fakirs and initiated Brahmins in their magical evocations. It has been, from time immemorial, and still is employed by the initiates of all countries, and the Tibetan Lamas claim that it is in this tongue that appear the mysterious characters on the leaves and bark of the sacred Kongu. Jokulio, who took such pains to penetrate the mysteries of the Brahmanical initiation and translating and commenting upon the Agrauchata Parichai, confesses the following. It is pretended also, without our being able to verify the assertion, that the magical evocations were pronounced in a particular language, and that it was forbidden, under pain of death, to translate them into vulgar dialects. The rare expressions that we have been able to catch like Wang, Hong, Shrum, Shorhim, are in fact most curious, and do not seem to belong to any known idiom. Those who have seen a fakir or a lama reciting his mantras in Khan. p. 47. Durations, know that he never pronounces the words audibly when preparing for a phenomenon. His lips move, and none will ever hear the terrible formula pronounced, except in the interior of the temples, and then in a cautious whisper. This, then, was the language now respectively baptized by every scientist, and, according to his imaginative and philological propensities, Kostiosemitic, Scythic, Protocaldian, and the like. Scarcely two of even the most learned Sanskrit philologists are agreed as to the true interpretation of Vedic words. Let one put forth an essay, a lecture, a treatise, a translation, a dictionary, and straightway all the others fall to quarreling with each other and with him as to his sins of omission and commission. Professor Whitney, greatest of American Orientalists, says that Professor Muller's notes on the Rig Veda Sanhita are far from showing that sound and thoughtful judgment, that moderation and economy which are among the most precious qualities of an exegete. Professor Muller angrily retorts upon his critics that not only is the joy embittered which is the inherent reward of all bona fide work, but selfishness, malignity, I, even untruthfulness, gain the upper hand, and the healthy growth of science is stunted. He differs in many cases from the explanations of Vedic words given by Professor Roth in his Sanskrit dictionary, and Professor Whitney shampoos both their heads by saying that there are, unquestionably, words and phrases as to which both alike will hereafter be set right. In Volume 1 of his chips, Professor Muller stigmatizes all the Vedas except the Rik, the Atarvaveda included, as theological twaddle, while Professor Whitney regards the latter as the most comprehensive and valuable of the four collections, next after the Rick. To return to the case of Jacolio, Professor Whitney brands him as a bungler and a humbug, and, as we remarked above, this is the very general verdict. But when the Bible Don's Lawn appeared, the Société Académique de Saint-Quentin requested M. Texter de Revisi, a learned Indianist, ten years governor of Karaikal, India, to report upon its merits. He was an ardent Catholic, and bitterly opposed Jacolio's conclusions where they discredited the Mosaic and Catholic revelations, but he was forced to say, written with good faith, in an easy, vigorous, and passionate style, of an easy and varied argumentation, the work of M. Jacolio is of absorbing interest, a learned work on known facts and with familiar arguments. Enough. Let Jacolio have the benefit of the doubt when such very imposing authorities are doing their best to show up each other as incompetence and literary journeymen. We quite agree with Professor Whitney that the truism, that, for European critics, 
it is far easier to pull two. P. 48. Pieces than to build up, is nowhere truer than in matters affecting the archaeology and history of India. Babylonia happened to be situated on the way of the great stream of the earliest Hindu emigration, and the Babylonians were one of the first peoples benefited thereby. These Kaldi were the worshippers of the moon god, Deus Lunis, from which fact we may infer that the Akkadians if such must be their name belong to the race of the kings of the moon, whom tradition shows as having reigned in Pruye now Allahabad. With them the trinity of Deus Lunis was manifested in the three lunar phases, completing the quaternary with the fourth, and typifying the death of the moon god in its gradual waning and final disappearance. This death was allegorized by them, and attributed to the triumph of the genius of evil over the light-giving deity, as the later nations allegorized the death of their sun gods, Osiris and Apollo, at the hands of Typhon and the great dragon Python, when the sun entered the winter solstice. Babel, Grek, and Akkad are names of the sun. The Zoroastrian oracles are full and explicit upon the subject of the divine triad. A triad of deity shines forth throughout the whole world, of which a monad is the head, admits the reverend Dr. Maurice. For from this triad, in the bosoms, are all things governed, says a Chaldean oracle. The Phos, Pier, and Phlox, of Sankani town, are light, fire, and flame, three manifestations of the sun who is one. Bell Saturn, Jupiter Bell, and Bell or Baal Chang are the Chaldean trinity, the Babylonian Bell is regarded in the Trium aspect of Belitin, Zeus Belus, the mediator, and Baal Chang who is Apollo Chamaeus. This was the Trine aspect of the highest god, who is, according to Barassus, either El, the Hebrew, Bell, Belitin, Mithra, or Zervana, and has the name Pi Alpha Tau Epsilon Rho, the father. The Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, corresponding to power, wisdom, and justice, which answer in their turn. p. 49. To spirit, matter, time, in the past, present, and future, can be found in the temple of Gurpuri. Thousands of dogmatic Brahmins worship these attributes of the Vedic deity, while the severe monks and nuns of Buddhistic Tibet recognize but the sacred trinity of the three cardinal virtues, poverty, chastity, and obedience, professed by the Christians, practiced by the Buddhists and some Hindus alone. The Persian triplicate deity also consists of three persons, Ormazd, Mithra, and Arman. That is that principle, says Porphyry, which the author of the Chaldaic summary saith, they conceive there is one principle of all things, and declare that is one and good. The Chinese idol Sampao, consists of three equal in all respects, and the Peruvians suppose their Tanga Tanga to be one and three, and three and one, says Fabin. The Egyptians have their Ameft, Ikten, and Fe and the triple god seated on the lotus can be seen in the St. Petersburg Museum, on a medal of the northern Tartars. Among the church dogmas which have most seriously suffered of late at the hands of the Orientalists, the last in question stands conspicuous. The reputation of each of the three personages of the anthropomorphic godhead as an original revelation to the Christians through divine will, has been badly compromised by inquiry into its predecessors and origin. Orientalists have published more about the similarity between Brahmanism, Buddhism, and Christianity than was strictly agreeable to the Vatican. Draper's assertion that paganism was modified by Christianity, Christianity by paganism, is being daily verified. Olympus was restored but the divinities passed under other names, he says, treating of the Constantine period. The more powerful provinces insisted on the adoption of their time-honored conceptions. Views of the Trinity in accordance with the Egyptian traditions were established. Not only was the adoration of Isis under a new name restored, but even her image, standing on the crescent moon, reappeared. The well-known effigy of that goddess with the infant Horus in her arms has descended to our days, and the beautiful artistic creations of the Madonna and Child. But a still earlier origin than the Egyptian and Chaldean can be assigned to the Virgin Mother of God, Queen of Heaven, though Isis. P. 50 is also by right the Queen of Heaven, and is generally represented carrying in her hand the crux and the composed of the mundane cross, and of the sorrows of the Gnostics, she is a great deal younger than the celestial virgin, Nath. In one of the tombs of the pharaohs Ramesses, in the valley of Beban el Moluk, in Thebes, Champollion, Jr., discovered a picture, according to his opinion the most ancient ever yet found. It represents the heaven symbolized by the figure of a woman bedecked with stars. The birth of the sun is figured by the form of a little child, issuing from the bosom of its divine mother. 
In the Book of Hermes, Commander is enunciated in distinct and unequivocal sentences, the whole Trinitarian dogma accepted by the Christians. The light is me, says Pomander, the divine thought. I am the newer intelligence, and I am thy God, and I am far older than the human principle which escapes from the shadow. I am the germ of thought, the resplendent word, the Son of God. Think that what thus sees and hears in me, is the verbum of the Master, it is the thought, which is God the Father. The celestial ocean, the ether, which flows from east to west, is the breath of the Father, the life-giving principle, the Holy Ghost. For they are not at all separated and their union is life. Ancient as may be the origin of Hermes, lost in the unknown days of Egyptian colonization, there is yet a far older prophecy, directly relating to the Hindu Krishna, according to the Brahmins. It is, to say the least, strange that the Christians claim to base their religion upon a prophecy of the Bible, which exists nowhere in that book. In what chapter or verse does Jehovah, the Lord God, promise Adam and Eve to send them a Redeemer who will save humanity? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, says the Lord God to the serpent, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In these words there is not the slightest allusion to a Redeemer, and the subtlest of intellects could not extract from them, as they stand in the third chapter of Genesis, anything like that which the Christians have contrived to find. On the other hand, in the traditions in Manu, Brahma promises directly to the first couple to send them a savior who will teach them the way to salvation. It is from the lips of a messenger of Brahma, who will be born in Kurukshra, Matsya, and the land of Pankola, also called Kanikubia, Mountain of the Virgin, that all men on earth will learn their duty, says Manu, Book 2, Slokas 19 and 20. The Mexicans call the father of their trinity Zona, the son Bacab, and the Holy Ghost Eshva, and say they received it, the doctrine. p. 51. From their ancestors. Among the Semitic nations we can trace the trinity to the prehistorical days of the fabled Sesestris, who is identified by more than one critic with Nimrod, the mighty hunter. Manithel makes the oracle rebuke the king, when the latter asks, Tell me, O thou strong in fire, who before me could subjugate all things? And who shall after me? And the oracle saith thus, First God, then the word, and then the spirit. In the foregoing lies the foundation of the fierce hatred of the Christians toward the pagans and the theurgists. Too much had been borrowed, the ancient religions and the Neoplatonists had been laid by them under contribution sufficiently to perplex the world for several thousand years. Had not the ancient creeds been speedily obliterated, it would have been found impossible to preach the Christian religion as a new dispensation, or the direct revelation from God the Father, through God the Son and under the influence of God the Holy Ghost. As a political exigence the fathers had to gratify the wishes of their rich converts instituted even the festivals of Pan. They went so far as to accept the ceremonies hitherto celebrated by the pagan world in honor of the God of the gardens, in all their primitive sincerity. It was time to sever the connection. Either the pagan worship and the Neoplatonic theurgy, with all ceremonial of magic, must be crushed out forever, or the Christians become Neoplatonists. The fierce polemics and single-handed battles between Irenaeus and the Gnostics are too well known to need repetition. They were carried on for over two centuries after the unscrupulous Bishop of Lyons had uttered his last religious paradox. Celsus, the Neoplatonist, and a disciple of the school of Ammonius Saccas, had thrown the Christians into perturbation, and even had arrested for a time the progress of proselytism by successfully proving that the original and pure forms of the most important dogmas of Christianity were to be found only in the teachings of Plato. Celsus accused them of accepting the worst superstitions of paganism, and of interpolating passages from the books of the Sibyls, without rightly understanding their meaning. The accusations were so plausible, and the facts so patent, that for a long time no Christian writer had ventured to answer the challenge. Origin at the fervent request of his friend, Ambrosius, was the first to take the defense in hand, for, having belonged to the same Platonic school of Ammonius, he was considered the most competent man to refute the well-founded charges. But his eloquence failed, and the only remedy that could be found was to destroy the writings of p. 52. Celsus themselves. This could be achieved only in the 5th century, when copies had been taken from this work, and many were those who had read and studied them. If no copy of it has descended to our present generation of scientists, it is not because there is none extant at present, but for the simple reason that the monks of a certain oriental church on Mount Athos will neither show nor confess they have one in their possession. 
perhaps they do not even know themselves the value of the contents of their manuscripts, on account of their great ignorance. The dispersion of the eclectic school had become the fondest hope of the Christians. It had been looked for and contemplated with intense anxiety. It was finally achieved. The members were scattered by the p. 53. Hand of the monster Theophilus, Bishop of Alexandria, and his nephew Cyril the murderer of the young, the learned, and the innocent Hypatia. With the death of the martyred daughter of Theon, the mathematician, there remained no possibility for the Neoplatonists to continue their school at Alexandria. During the lifetime of the youthful Hypatia her friendship and influence with Orestes, the governor of the city, had assured the philosopher's security and protection against their murderous enemies. With her death they had lost their strongest friend. How much she was revered by all who knew her for her erudition, noble virtues, and character, we can infer from the letters addressed to her by Synesius, Bishop of Ptolemaeus, fragments of which have reached us. My heart yearns for the presence of your divine spirit, he wrote in 413 AD, which more than anything else could alleviate the bitterness of my fortunes. At another time he says, Oh, my mother, my sister, my teacher, my benefactor. My soul is very sad. The recollection of my children I have lost is killing me. When I have news of you and learn, as I hope, that you are more fortunate than myself, I am at least only half unhappy. What would have been the feelings of this most noble and worthy of Christian bishops, who had surrendered family and children and happiness for the faith into which he had been attracted, had a prophetic vision disclosed to him that the only friend that had been left to him, his mother, sister, benefactor, would soon become an unrecognizable mass of flesh and blood, pounded to jelly under the blows of the club of Peter the reader that her youthful, innocent body would be cut to pieces, the flesh scraped from the bones, by oyster shells and the rest of her cast into the fire, by order of the same bishop Cyril he knew so well Cyril, the canonized saint. There has never been a religion in the annals of the world with such a bloody record as Christianity. All the rest, including the traditional fierce fights of the chosen people with their next of kin, the idolatrous tribes of Israel, pale before the murderous fanaticism of the alleged followers of Christ. Even the rapid spread of Mohammedanism before the conquering sword of the Islam prophet, is a direct consequence of the p. 54. Bloody riots and fights among Christians. It was the intestine war between the Nestorians and Cyrillians that engendered Islamism, and it is in the convent of Basra that the prolific seed was first sown by Bahira, the Nestorian monk. Freely watered by rivers of blood, the tree of Mecca has grown till we find it in the present century overshadowing nearly 200 millions of people. The recent Bulgarian atrocities are but the natural outgrowth of the triumph of Cyril and the Mariolators. The cruel, crafty politician, the plotting monk, glorified by ecclesiastical history with the aureole of a martyred saint. The despoiled philosophers, the Neoplatonists, and the Gnostics, daily anathematized by the Church all over the world for long and dreary centuries. The curse of the unconcerned deity hourly invoked on the Magian rites and theurgic practice, and the Christian clergy themselves using sorcery for ages. Hypatia, the glorious maiden philosopher, torn to pieces by the Christian mob. And such as Catherine de' Medici's, Lucrezia Borgia, Joanna of Naples, and the Isabellas of Spain, presented to the world as the faithful daughters of the church some even decorated by the Pope with the Order of the Immaculate Rose, the highest emblem of womanly purity and virtue, a symbol sacred to the Virgin Mother of God. Such are the examples of human justice. How far less blasphemous appears a total rejection of Mary as an Immaculate Goddess, than an idolatrous worship of her, accompanied by such practices. In the next chapter we will present a few illustrations of sorcery, as practiced under the patronage of the Roman Church.
197. Monk, in his work on Palestine, affirms that there were 4,000 Essenes living in the desert, that they had their mystical books, and predicted the future. The Nabatheans, with very little difference indeed, adhered to the same belief as the Nazarenes and the Sabaeans, and all of them honored John the Baptist more than his successor Jesus. The Persian Nazidi say that they originally came to Syria from Bizra. They use baptism, and believe in seven archangels, though paying at the same time reverence to Satan. Their prophet Ease, who flourished long prior to Muhammad, taught that God will send a messenger, and that the latter would reveal to him a book which is already written in heaven from the eternity. The Nabatheans inhabited the Lebanon, as their descendants do to the present day, and their religion was from its origin purely Kabbalistic. Maimonides speaks of them as if he identified them with the Sabaeans. I will mention to thee the writings, respecting the belief and institutions of the Sabaeans, he says. The most famous is the book The Agriculture of the Nabatheans, which has been translated by Ibn Waho Hijab. This book is full of heathenish foolishness. It speaks of the preparations of talismans, the drawing down of the powers of the spirits, magic, demons, and ghouls, which make their abode in the desert. There are traditions among the tribes living scattered about beyond the Jordan, as there are many such also among the descendants of the Samaritans at Damascus, Gaza, and at Niplosa, the ancient Shechem. Many of these tribes have, notwithstanding the persecutions of eighteen centuries, retained the faith of their fathers in its primitive simplicity. It is there that we have to go for traditions based on historical truths, however disfigured by exaggeration and inaccuracy, and compare them with the religious legends of the fathers which they call Revelation. Eusebius states that before the siege of Jerusalem the small Christian community comprising members of whom many, if not all, knew Jesus and his apostles personally took refuge in the little town of Pella, on the opposite shore of the Jordan. Surely these simple people, separated for centuries from the rest of the world, ought to have preserved their traditions fresher than any other nations. It is in Palestine that we have to search for the clearest waters of Christianity, let alone its source. The first Christians, after the death of Jesus, all joined together for a time, whether p. 198. They were Ebionites, Nazarenes, Gnostics, or others. They had no Christian dogmas in those days, and their Christianity consisted in believing Jesus to be a prophet, this belief varying from seeing in him simply a just man, or a holy, inspired prophet, a vehicle used by Christos and Sophia to manifest themselves through. These all united together in opposition to the synagogue and the tyrannical technicalities of the Pharisees, until the primitive group separated into two distinct branches which, we may correctly term the Christian Kabbalists of the Jewish Tanaim school, and the Christian Kabbalists of the Platonic Gnosis. The former were represented by the party composed of the followers of Peter, and John, the author of the Apocalypse, the latter ranged with the Pauline Christianity, blending itself, at the end of the second century, with the Platonic philosophy, and engulfing, Still later, the Gnostic sects, whose symbols and misunderstood mysticism overflowed the Church of Rome. Amid this jumble of contradictions, what Christian is secure in confessing himself such? In the Old Syriac Gospel according to Luke, 3. 22, the Holy Spirit is said to have descended in the likeness of a dove. Jesus, full of the sacred spirit, returned from Jordan, and the spirit led him into the desert. Old Syriac, Luke 4. 1. Tremelius. The difficulty, says Dunlap, was that the Gospels declared that John the Baptist saw the Spirit, the power of God, descend upon Jesus after he had reached manhood, and if the Spirit then first descended upon him, there was some ground for the opinion of the Ebionites and Nazarenes who denied his preceding existence, and refused him the attributes of the Logos. The Gnostics, on the other hand, objected to the flesh, but conceded the Logos. John's Apocalypsis, and the explanations of sincere Christian bishops, like Synesius, who, to the last, adhere to the Platonic doctrines, make us think that the wisest and safest way is to hold to that sincere primitive faith which seems to have actuated the above-named bishop. This best, sincerest, and most unfortunate of Christians, addressing the unknown, exclaims, O father of the worlds, father of the eons, artificer of the gods, it is holy to praise. But Synesius had Hypatia for instructor, and this is why we find him confessing in all sincerity his opinions and profession of faith. The rabble desires. p. 199. Nothing better than to be deceived. As regards myself, therefore, I will always be a philosopher with myself, 
but I must be priest with the people. Holy is God the Father of all being, holy is God, whose wisdom is carried out into execution by his own powers, holy art thou, who through the word had created all. Therefore, I believe in thee, and bear testimony, and go into the life and light. Thus speaks Hermes Trismegistus, the heathen divine. What Christian bishop could have said better than that? The apparent discrepancy of the four Gospels as a whole, does not prevent every narrative given in the New Testament however much disfigured having a groundwork of truth. To this, are cunningly adapted details made to fit the later exigencies of the Church. So, propped up partially by indirect evidence, still more by blind faith, they have become, with time, articles of faith. Even the fictitious massacre of the innocents by King Herod has a certain foundation to it, in its allegorical sense. Apart from the now-discovered fact that the whole story of such a massacre of the innocents is bodily taken from the Hindu Bhagav Gita, and Brahmanical traditions, the legend refers, moreover, allegorically, to an historical fact. King Herod is the type of Kansa, the tyrant of Madara, the maternal uncle of Krishna, to whom astrologers predicted that a son of his niece Devaki would deprive him of his throne. Therefore he gives orders to kill the male child that is born to her but Krishna escapes his fury through the protection of Mahadeva, the great god, who causes the child to be carried away to another city, out of Kansa's reach. After that, in order to be sure and kill the right boy, on whom he failed to lay his murderous hands, Kansa has all the male newborn infants within his kingdom killed. Krishna is also worshipped by the Gopas, the shepherds, of the land. Though this ancient Indian legend bears a very suspicious resemblance to the more modern biblical romance, Gafferal and others attribute the origin of the latter to the persecutions during the Herodian reign of the Kabbalists and the wise men, who had not remained strictly orthodox. The latter, as well as the prophets, were nicknamed the innocents, and the babes, on account of their holiness. As in the case of certain degrees of modern masonry, the adepts reckon their grade of initiation by a symbolic age. Thus all who, when chosen king, was a choice and goodly man, and from his shoulders upward was higher than any of the people, is described in Catholic versions, as child of one year when he began to reign, which, in its literal sense, is a palpa. p. 200. Blay absurdity. But in 1 Samuel x, his anointing by Samuel and initiation are described, and at verse 6, Samuel uses this significant language, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee and thou shalt prophesy with him, and shalt be turned into another man. The phrase above quoted is thus made plain he had received one degree of initiation and was symbolically described as a child one year old. The Catholic Bible, from which the text is quoted, with charming candor says in a footnote, it is extremely difficult to explain, meaning that Saul was a child of one year. But undaunted by any difficulty the editor, nevertheless, does take upon himself to explain it, and adds, a child of one year. That is, he was good and like an innocent child. An interpretation as ingenious as it is pious, and which if it does no good can certainly do no harm. If the explanation of the Kabbalists is rejected, then the whole subject falls into confusion, worse still for it becomes a direct plagiarism from the Hindu legend. All the commentators have agreed that a literal massacre of young children is nowhere mentioned in history, and that, moreover, an occurrence like that would have made such a bloody page in Roman annals that the record of it would have been preserved for us by every author of the day. Herod himself was subject to the Roman law, and undoubtedly he would have paid the penalty of such a monstrous crime, with his own life. But if, on the one hand, we have not the slightest trace of this fable in history, on the other, we find in the p. 201. Official complaints of the synagogue abundant evidence of the persecution of the initiates. The Talmud also corroborates it. The Jewish version of the birth of Jesus is recorded in the Sefer Toldos Jeshu in the following words. Mary having become the mother of a son, named Jehoja, and the boy growing up, she entrusted him to the care of the rabbi Elanan, and the child progressed in knowledge, for he was well gifted with spirit and understanding. Rabbi Jehoja, son of Perchia, continued the education of Jehoja, Jesus, after Elanan, and initiated him in the secret knowledge, but the king, Janaeus, Having given orders to slay all the initiates, Jehoshaphat ben Perchia fled to Alexandria, in Egypt, taking the boy with him. While in Alexandria, continues the story, they were received in the house of a rich and learned lady, personified Egypt. Young Jesus found her beautiful, notwithstanding a defect in her eyes, and declared so to his master. 
Upon hearing this, the latter became so angry that his people should find in the land of bondage anything good, that he cursed him and drove the young man from his presence. Then follow a series of adventures told in allegorical language, which show that Jesus supplemented his initiation in the Jewish Kabbalah with an additional acquisition of the secret wisdom of Egypt. When the persecution ceased, they both returned to Judea. The real grievances against Jesus are stated by the learned author of Tela Ignea Satane, The Fiery Darts of Satan, to be two in number. First, that he had discovered the great mysteries of their temple, by having been initiated in Egypt, and 2d, that he had profaned them by exposing them to the vulgar, who misunderstood and disfigured them. This is what they say. There exists, in the sanctuary of the living God, a cubical stone, on which are sculptured the holy characters, the combination of which gives the explanation of the attributes and powers of the incommunicable name. This explanation is the secret key of all the occult sciences and forces in nature. It is what the Hebrews call the Shamham Faresh. This stone is watched by two lines of gold, who roar as soon as it is approached. The gates of the temple were never lost sight of, and the p. 202. Door of the sanctuary opened but once a year, to admit the high priest alone. But Jesus, who had learned in Egypt the great secrets at the initiation, forged for himself invisible keys, and thus was enabled to penetrate into the sanctuary unseen. He copied the characters on the cubical stone, and hid them in his thigh, after which, emerging from the temple, he went abroad and began astounding people with his miracles. The dead were raised at his command, the lepers and the obsessed were healed. He forced the stones which lay buried for ages at the bottom of the sea to rise to the surface until they formed a mountain, from the top of which he preached. The Sefer told us states further that, unable to displace the cubical stone of the sanctuary, Jesus fabricated one of clay which he showed to the nations and passed it off for the true cubical stone of Israel. This allegory, like the rest of them in such books, is written inside and outside it has its secret meaning, and ought to be read two ways. The Kabbalistic books explain its mystical meaning. Further, the same Talmudist says, in substance, the following, Jesus was thrown in prison, and kept there forty days, then flogged as a seditious rebel, then stoned as a blasphemer in a place called Lude and finally allowed to expire upon a cross. All this, explains Levi, because he revealed to the people the truths which they, the Pharisees, wished to bury for their own use. He had divinely occult theology of Israel, had compared it with the wisdom of Egypt, and found thereby the reason for a universal religious synthesis. However cautious one ought to be in accepting anything about Jesus from Jewish sources, it must be confessed that in some things they seem to be more correct in their statements, whenever their direct interest in stating facts is not concerned, then are good but two jealous fathers. One thing is certain, James, the brother of the Lord, is silent about the resurrection. He terms Jesus nowhere son of God, nor even Christ God. Once only, speaking of Jesus, he calls him the Lord of glory, but so do the Nazarenes when writing about their prophet Iwen and Bar Zechariah, or John, son of Zacharias, St. John Baptist. Their favorite expressions about their prophet are the same as those used by James when speaking of Jesus. A man of the seed of a man. Messenger of life, of light, my Lord Apostle. King sprung of light, and so on. Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, etc. p. 203. Says James in his epistle, 2. 1. Presumably addressing Christ as God. Peace to thee, my Lord, John Abo Sabo. Lord of Glory, says the Codex Nazareus, 2, 19, known to address but a prophet. Ye have condemned and killed the just, says James, v. 6. Iwanan, John, is the just one, he comes in the way of justice, says Matthew, 21. 32, Syriac text. James does not even call Jesus Messiah, in the sense given to the title by the Christians, but alludes to the Kabbalistic King Messiah who is Lord of Sabaoth, v. 4, and repeats several times that the Lord will come, but identifies the latter nowhere with Jesus. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, be patient, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, v. 7, 8. And he adds, Take, my brethren, the prophet, Jesus, who has spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Though in the present version the word prophet stands in the plural, yet this is a deliberate falsification of the original, the purpose of which is too evident. James, 
immediately after having cited the prophets as an example, adds, Behold, ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord thus combining the examples of these two admirable characters, and placing them on a perfect equality. But we have more to adduce in support of our argument. Did not Jesus himself glorify the prophet of the Jordan? What went he out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. Verily, I say unto you, among them that are born of women there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. And of whom was he who spoke thus born? It is but the Roman Catholics who have changed Mary, the mother of Jesus, into a goddess. In the eyes of all other Christians she was a woman, whether his own birth was immaculate or otherwise. According to strict logic, then, Jesus confessed John greater than himself. Note how completely this matter is disposed of by the language employed by the angel Gabriel when addressing Mary, Blessed art thou among women. These words are unequivocal. He does not adore her as the mother of God, nor does he call her goddess, he does not even address her as virgin, but he calls her woman, and only distinguishes her above other women as having had better fortune, through her purity. The Nazarenes were known as Baptists, Sabians, and John's Christians. Their belief was that the Messiah was not the Son of God, but simply a prophet who would follow John. Yohanan, the son of the Abba Sabo Zechariah, shall say to himself, Whoever will believe in my justice. P. 204. And my baptism shall be joined to my association. He shall share with me the seed which is the abode of life, of the supreme mono, and of living fire. Codex Nazareus. 2. P. 115. Origen remarks there are some who said of John, the Baptist, that he was the anointed, Christus. The angel Raziel of the Kabbalists is the angel Gabriel of the Nazarenes, and it is the latter who is chosen of all the celestial hierarchy by the Christians to become the messenger of the Annunciation. The genius sent by the Lord of Celsitude is Ebel Zivo, whose name is also called Gabriel Legatus. Paul must have had the sect of the Nazarenes in mind when he said, and last of all he, Jesus, was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time, 1 Corns, 15. 8. Thus reminding his listeners of the expression usual to the Nazarenes, who term the Jews the abortions, or born out of time. Paul prides himself of belonging to a heresy. When the metaphysical conceptions of the Gnostics, who saw in Jesus the Logos and the Anointed, began to gain ground, the earliest Christians separated from the Nazarenes, who accused Jesus of perverting the doctrines of John, and changing the baptism of the Jordan. Directly, says Melman, as it, the Gospel, got beyond the borders of Palestine, and the name of Christ had acquired sanctity and veneration in the eastern cities, he became a kind of metaphysical impersonation, while the religion lost its purely moral caste and assumed the character of a speculative theogony. The only half-original document that has reached us from the primitive apostolic days, is the Logia of Matthew. The real, genuine doctrine has remained in the hands of the Nazarenes, in this Gospel of Matthew containing the secret doctrine, the sayings of Jesus, mentioned by Papias. These sayings were, no doubt, of the same nature as the small manuscripts placed in the hands of the Neophytes, who were candidates for the initiations into the mysteries, and which contain the Aparita, the revelations of some important rites and symbols. For why should Matthew take such precautions to make them secret were it otherwise? Primitive Christianity had its grip, passwords, and degrees of initiation. The innumerable Gnostic gems and amulets are weighty proofs of it. It is a whole symbolical science. The Kabbalists were the first to embellish the universal logos, with such terms as light of light, the p. 205. Messenger of life and light, and we find these expressions adopted in toto by the Christians, with the addition of nearly all the Gnostic terms such as pleroma, fullness, archons, eons, etc. as to the firstborn, the first, and the only begotten these are as old as the world. Origen shows the word Logos as existing among the Brahmins. The Brahmins say that the god is light, not such as one sees, nor such as the sun and fire, but they have the god Logos, not the articulate, the Logos of the Gnosis, through whom the highest mysteries of the Gnosis are seen by the wise. The Acts in the Fourth Gospel team with Gnostic expressions. The Kabbalistic, God's firstborn emanated from the Most High, together with that which is the spirit of the anointing, and again they called him the anointed of the highest, are reproduced in spirit and substance by the author of the gospel according to John. That was the true light, and the light shineth in darkness. And the word was made flesh. And his fullness, pleroma, have all we received, 
etc. John I. Et sec. The Christ, then, and the Logos existed ages before Christianity. The Oriental Gnosis was studied long before the days of Moses, and we have to seek for the origin of all these in the archaic periods of the primeval Asiatic philosophy. Peter's second epistle and Jude's fragment, preserved in the New Testament, show by their phraseology that they belong to the Kabbalistic Oriental Gnosis, for they use the same expressions as did the Christian Gnostics who built a part of their system from the Oriental Kabbalah. Presumptuous are they, the Ephites, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, says Peter, 2d Epistle 2. 10. The original motto for the later abusive Tertullian and Irenaeus. Likewise, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion and speak evil of dignities, says Jude, repeating the very words of Peter, and thereby expressions consecrated in the Kabbalah. Dominion is the empire, the tenth of the Kabbalistic Sephiroth. The powers and dignities are the subordinate. p. 206. Genia of the archangels and angels of the Sohar. These emanations are the very life and soul of the Kabbalah and Zoroastrianism, and the Talmud itself, in its present state, is all borrowed from the Zendavista. Therefore, by adopting the views of Peter, Jude, and other Jewish apostles, the Christians have become but a descending sect of the Persians, for they do not even interpret the meaning of all such powers as the true Kabbalists do. Paul's warning his converts against the worshipping of angels, shows how well he appreciated, even so early as his period, the dangers of borrowing from a metaphysical doctrine the philosophy of which could be rightly interpreted but by its well-learned adherents, the Magi and the Jewish Tenaim. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, is a sentence laid right at the door of Peter and his champions. In the Talmud, Michael is Prince of Water, who has seven inferior spirits subordinate to him. He is the patron, the guardian angel of the Jews, as Daniel informs us, v. 21, and the Greekophytes, who identified him with their phimorphos, the personified creation of the envy and malice of Ildabaoth, the Demiurgus, creator of the material world, and undertook to prove that he was also Samuel, the Hebrew prince of the evil spirits, or Persian devs, were naturally regarded by the Jews as blasphemers. But did Jesus ever sanction this belief in angels except in so far as hinting that they were the messengers and subordinates of God? And here the origin of the later splits between Christian beliefs is directly traceable to these two early contradictory views. Paul, believing in all such occult powers in the world unseen, but ever present, says, You walked according to the eon of this world, according to the archon, build about, the demiurge, that has the domination of the air, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against the dominations, the powers, the lords of darkness, the mischievousness of spirits in the upper regions. This sentence, you were dead in sin and error, for you walked according to the archon, or Ilda Bauth, the god and creator of matter of the Ephites, shows unequivocally that, first, Paul, notwithstanding some dissensions with the more important doctrines of the Gnostics, shared more or less their cosmogonical views on the emanations, and 2d, that he was fully aware that this to me. P. 207. Urge, whose Jewish name was Jehovah, was not the God preached by Jesus. And now, if we compare the doctrine of Paul with the religious views of Peter and Jude, we find that, not only did they worship Michael, the archangel, but that also they reverenced Satan, because the latter was also, before his fall, an angel. This they do quite openly, and abuse the Gnostics for speaking evil of him. No one can deny the following, Peter, when denouncing those who are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, adds immediately, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusations against them, the dignities, before the Lord, too. 11. Who are the dignities? Jude, in his general epistle, makes the word as clear as day. The dignities are the devils. Complaining of the disrespect shown by the Gnostics to the powers and dominions, Jude argues in the very words of Peter, and yet, Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee, I. 9. Is this plain enough? If not, then we have the Kabbalah to prove who were the dignities. Considering that Deuteronomy tells us that the Lord himself buried Moses in a valley of Moab. 34. 6. And no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day, 
This biblical lapsus ingui of Jude gives a strong coloring to the assertions of some of the Gnostics. They claim but what was secretly taught by the Jewish Kabbalists themselves, to wit, that the high supreme God was unknown and invisible, the king of light is a closed eye, that Ilabaoth, the Jewish second Adam, was the real Demiurge, and that Yao, Adonai, Sabaoth, and Eloi were the quaternary emanation which formed the unity of the God of the Hebrews Jehovah. Moreover, the latter was also called Michael and Samael by them, and regarded but as an angel, several removed from the Godhead. In holding to such a belief, the Gnostics countenanced the teachings of the greatest of the Jewish doctors, Hillel, and other Babylonian divines. Josephus shows the great deference of the official synagogue in Jerusalem to the wisdom of the schools of Central Asia. The colleges of Sora, Pumbiditha, and Idea were considered the headquarters of esoteric and theological learning by all the schools of Palestine. The Chaldean version of the Pentateuch, made by the one on Babylonian divine, Ankelos, was regarded as the most authoritative of all, and it is according to this learned rabbi that Hillel and other Tanaim after him held that the being who appeared to Moses in the burning bush, on Mount Sinai, and who finally buried him, was the angel of the Lord. p. 208. Memro, and not the Lord himself, and that he whom the Hebrews of the Old Testament mistook for Eho was but his messenger, one of his sons, or emanations. All this establishes but one logical conclusion namely, that the Gnostics were by far the superiors of the disciples, in point of education and general information, even in a knowledge of the religious tenets of the Jews themselves. While they were perfectly well versed in the Chaldean wisdom, the well-meaning, pious, but fanatical as well as ignorant disciples, unable to fully understand or grasp the religious spirit of their own system, were driven in their disputations to such convincing logic as the use of brute beasts, sows, dogs, and other epithets so freely bestowed by Peter. Since then, the epidemic has reached the apex of the sacerdotal hierarchy. From the day when the founder of Christianity uttered the warning, that he who shall say to his brother, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire, all who have passed as its leaders, beginning with the ragged fishermen of Galilee, and ending with the jeweled pontiffs, have seemed to vie with each other in the invention of opprobrious epithets for their opponents. So we find Luther passing a final sentence on the Catholics, and exclaiming that the papists are all asses, put them in whatever form you like, whether they are boiled, roasted, baked, fried, skinned, hashed, they will be always the same asses. Calvin called the victims he persecuted, and occasionally burned, malicious barking dogs, full of bestiality and insolence, base corruptors of the sacred writings, etc. Dr. Warburton terms the popish religion an impious farce, and Monsignor Dupin Loop asserts that the Protestant Sabbath service is the devil's mass, and all clergymen are thieves and ministers of the devil. The same spirit of incomplete inquiry and ignorance has led the Christian Church to bestow on its most holy apostles, titles assumed by their most desperate opponents, the heretics and Gnostics. So we find, for instance, Paul termed the vase of election vas electionis, a title chosen by Manes, the greatest heretic of his day in the eyes of the Church, Manes meaning, in the Babylonian language, the chosen vessel or receptacle. So with the Virgin Mary. They were so little gifted with originality, that they copied from the Egyptian and Hindu religions their several. p. 209. Apostrophes to their respective virgin mothers. The juxtaposition of a few examples will make this clear. Hindu. Litany of Our Lady Nari, Virgin, also Devanaki. 1. Holy Nari Mariyama, Mother of Perpetual Fecundity. 2. Mother of an Incarnated God Vishnu, Devanaki. 3. Mother of Krishna. 4. Eternal Virginity Kanyubhava. 5. Mother Pure Essence, Akasha. 6. Virgin Most Chaste Kanya. 7. Mother Taumatra, of the Five Virtues or Elements. 8. Virgin Trigana, of the Three Elements, Power or Richness, Love, and Mercy. 9. Mirror of Supreme Conscience Ahankara. 10. Wise Mother Saraswati. 11. Virgin of the White Lotus, Pedma or Kamala. 12. Womb of Gold Hyrania. 13. Celestial Light Lakshmi. 14. Ditto. 15. Queen of Heaven, and of the Universe Sakti. 16. Mother Soul of All Beings Paramatma. 17. Devanaki is conceived without sin, and immaculate herself. 
according to the Brahmanic fancy. Egyptian Litany of Our Lady Isis, Virgin 1. Holy Isis, Universal Mother Muth 2. Mother of Gods Athar 3. Mother of Horus 4. Virgo Generatrix Nath 5. Mother Soul of the Universe Anuk 6. Virgin Sacred Earth Isis 7. Mother of all the virtues may, with the same qualities. 8. Illustrious Isis, most powerful, merciful, just. Book of the Dead. 9. Mirror of Justice and Truth may. 10. Mysterious Mother of the World Budo, Secret Wisdom. 11. Sacred Lotus. 12. Sistrum of Gold. 13. Astarte, Syrian, Astroth, Jewish. 14. Argue of the Moon. 15. Queen of Heaven, and of the Universe Sati. 16. Model of all Mothers of Her. 17. Isis is a Virgin Mother. Roman Catholic. Litany of Our Lady of Loreto, Virgin. 1. Holy Mary, Mother of Divine Grace. 2. Mother of God. 3. Mother of Christ. 4. Virgin of Virgins. 5. Mother of Divine Grace. 6. Virgin Most Chaste. 7. Mother Most Pure. Mother Undefiled. Mother Inviolate. Mother Most Amiable. Mother Most Admirable. 8. Virgin Most Powerful. Virgin Most Merciful. Virgin Most Faithful. 9. Mirror of Justice. 10. Seat of Wisdom. 11. Mystical Rose. 12. House of Gold. 13. Morning Star. 14. Ark of the Covenant. 15. Queen of Heaven. 16. Major Dolorosa. 17. Mary Conceived Without Sin. In accordance with later orders. p. 210. If the Virgin Mary has her nuns, who are consecrated to her and bound to live in chastity, so that Isis her nuns in Egypt, as Vesta had hers at Rome, in the Hindunari, mother of the world hers. The virgins consecrated to her cultists the devadasi of the temples, who were the nuns of the days of old lived in great chastity, and were objects of the most extraordinary veneration, as the holy women of the goddess. Would the missionaries and some travelers reproachfully point to the modern devadasis, or notch girls? For all response, we would beg them to consult the official reports of the last quarter century, cited in Chapter 2, as to certain discoveries made at the raising of convents, in Austria and Italy. Thousands of infant skulls were exhumed from ponds, subterranean vaults, and gardens of convents. Nothing to match this was ever found in heathen lands. Christian theology, getting the doctrine of the archangels and angels directly from the Oriental Kabbalah, of which the Mosaic Bible is but an allegorical screen, ought at least to remember the hierarchy invented by the former for these personified emanations. The hosts of the cherubim and seraphim, with which we generally see the Catholic Madonna surrounded in their pictures, belong, together with the Elohim and Beni Elohim of the Hebrews, to the third Kabbalistic world, Jezira. This world is but one remove higher than Asaya, the fourth and lowest world, in which dwell the grossest and most material beings the Klippith, who delight in evil and mischief, and whose chief is Belial explaining, in his way, of course, the various heresies of the first two centuries, Irenaeus says, our heretics hold, that Propator is known but to the only begotten Son, that is to the mind, the new. It was the Valentinians, the followers of the profoundest doctor of the Gnosis, Valentinus, who held that there was a perfect ion, who existed before Bythos, or Bathon, the depth, called Propator. This is again Kabbalistic, for in the Sohar of Simon ben Iochai, we read the following, Senior occultatus est et absconditus, microprosopus manifestus est, et non manifestus, Rosenroth, the Sohar Liber Mysteries, 4, 1. In the religious metaphysics of the Hebrews, the highest one is an abstraction, he is without form or being, with no likeness with anything else. And even Philo calls the Creator, the Logos who stands next God, the second God, the second God who is his wisdom. God is nothing. He is nameless, and therefore called Ainsof the word Ain meaning nothing. But if, according to the older Jews, 
Jehovah is the God, and he manifested himself several times to Moses in the p. 211. Prophets, and the Christian church anathematized the Gnostics who denied the fact how comes it, then, that we read in the fourth gospel that no man hath seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, he hath declared him. The very words of the Gnostics, in spirit and substance. This sentence of St. John or rather whoever wrote the gospel now bearing his name floors all the Petrine arguments against Simon Magus, without appeal. The words are repeated and emphasized in chapter 6, not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he, Jesus, hath seen the Father. 46 The very objection brought forward by Simon in the homilies. These words prove that either the author of the fourth evangel had no idea of the existence of the homilies, or that he was not John, the friend and companion of Peter, whom he contradicts point-blank with this emphatic assertion. Be it as it may, this sentence, like many more that might be profitably cited, blends Christianity completely with the Oriental Gnosis, and hence with the Kabbalah. While the doctrines, ethical code, and observances of the Christian religion were all appropriated from Brahmanism and Buddhism, its ceremonials, vestments, and pageantry were taken bodily from Lamaism. The Romish monastery and nunnery are almost several copies of similar religious houses in Tibet and Mongolia, and interested explorers of Buddhist lands, when obliged to mention the unwelcome fact, have had no other alternative left them but, with an anachronism unsurpassed in recklessness, to charge the offense of plagiarism upon the religious system their own mother church had despoiled. This makeshift has served its purpose and had its day. The time has at last come when this page of history must be written.